it and okay. until, until he comes Recording on. Recording is on. All right. Yeah, so, okay. So so anyway, so yeah, so we were saying we're waiting everybody for uh, Dr. Kevin McCann. And we're just discussing the last thing and the whole uh, the whole approach of what we're doing and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I, mean, I hope he comes on. I don't know if he will, but uh, yeah, the reason why there are only a few of us on is um, Gary. Gary said that basically I should just do this myself. I didn't want to say just, you know, for a number of reasons. It just sends a message that it's like just me comes on. <laughs> it's like that. I didn't think that was quite the right thing. Uh, so I thought. You know, other people should be on too, but uh, you know, just just whether people want to be on or not, they should be on. But, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, Gary doesn't want to be on, um, and so I think other, other people in general is like. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I, I I thought thought it was kind of going to be <laughs> pretty much you know us. <laughs> see what you see the three of us here. Um, yeah, so what, what we're basically talking about is, uh, you know, this is real dynamite stuff. And, I, and you know, like I lost patrons over this, but I still want to pursue it because uh, everybody talks about talking to the, the far right. Uh, I mean, all the crowd that I've targeted deliberately is on the left. Um, and and I, uh, I don't see myself as left and right. I really do <laughs> see myself as beyond politics. But, you know, I went to this thing from Burning Pink last night and, uh, you know, Roger Hallam's new political party in Britain, basically just a pub, virtual pub thing. Um, Sophie was there too. And the thing is, the, the, the guys are just such nice guys. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super nice. I love but they, they all say, like, you know, we got to get beyond politics and stuff. And everybody agrees we've got to get beyond politics. But it's so ironic that nothing is more left ring than saying we've got to get beyond politics. I mean, it's if you say we've got to get beyond politics, it means left wing. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a trope, you know, it's basically it's a it's a tribal signal to say beyond politics. We are all beyond politics. I say, okay, if you are beyond politics, then talk to Kevin McCann. No, we can't. He's a fascist racist. They say like, oh, so you're not beyond politics, are you? It's a fucking lie. So none of these people are beyond politics. They extreme. They they middle of the road, left wing mainstream, and completely up to their necks in politics and identity politics. And and so they so it's like stop the lies, stop the crap. They all agree we have to stop lying, and we all have to get together and say like, oh, well, put your money where your mouth is. Talk to the extreme right. Talk to the libertarian right. And so it's easy for all the left wingers to you know basically get in a room and you know be accepting of each other because they have the broad idea that you know everybody should be one. But there's no so, challenge. There's no challenge then. There's it's no challenge, yeah. I mean, the left is at each other's throats, but it's it's just because they intellectualize and get you know get into identity politics. So they're, they're all egos bumping, but they never come up with an opposite ego. Uh, wait, wait a sec. I got to uh, I got to just catch it. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, uh, actually, join. <laughs> oh yeah. Actually, yeah. Jo were you able to join oh, the Burning Pink? Yeah, I was in the, the burning pink. Uh, I, I, I had microphone problems. I couldn't oh, join in. But uh, yeah, I was listening to them. They were all talking about the experience. There was a really interesting guy who was living in the desert in a tent and he was talking about prepping. He was in America. Do you remember that guy who came on? And, and he was just he was talking about the, the, the rednecks coming and taking over his thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but he was so, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But but you know he he was saying like oh you know but he he couldn't talk to the rednecks and I was saying like he's yeah. completely intolerant of the rednecks why because they intolerant it's like <laughs> oh, pot meat kettle man it's, it's like so yeah the, the trip that I'm on is everybody has to get over their fucking yeah. ego we have to make a bonfire of the vanities and all put our egos in 
but I, I want to try and show people how to do it. I mean, that's really hubris on my part, really arrogant to, to think I can pull this off. When but you had I, a great opening with Kevin, when you started to talk about South Africa, you suddenly got a sort of aura around you, and he was just completely, you know, I was, I, did you see that? Did you notice that in the last talk? He no. was intrigued. <laughs> he was intrigued. I, I saw. I yeah, think it's... So I think he knows the problem well. I think he, he, he identifies with that. And uh, yeah, it was a nice opening. And when you mentioned you had been army too, there was yeah. kind of, you know, there was understanding. So no, but I'm not saying that in an ironic way, but we have to find grounds where we can, if we want to exchange with people who are completely different from us, that we don't know. We have to find places where we have some kind of, you know, common ground and then expand. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but we, we, the, the thing is, everybody thinks we have to get along. We don't have to get along. It's, it's no. like, like, you know, the lion does not have to lie down with the lamb. It's bullshit. It's a bullshit slave narrative that, that tells us slaves. It's basically all we have to do is basically get over ourselves. So it's basically you, you don't have to tolerate people. You just don't have to put other people in a fucking gas chamber. It's like it's just a question of extremism. So you you know you can understand anybody, absolutely anybody. It's like I I had this thing when I was when I was younger, and it actually still lasts today. But I couldn't bear it if I couldn't understand somebody. So I would get to like a an interest in all these historical figures because I go. But why the fuck does he do that? Why is he like that? I never thought of them as beyond the pale or anything like that. I, I, until I could absolutely stand in their sandals, I wouldn't give up. So when, when I was about 15, then I got fascinated by Hitler. And, I, and, and I, I just, until I could absolutely understand Hitler, then I, I wouldn't let it go. I read Mein Kampf mm. cover to cover. As a 15-year-old, you try read Mein Kampf. Wow. It's the worst fucking wow. book I've ever written. I mean, it's the most badly written book in the thing. No one's read it cover to cover. As 15, I read it to cover just because I was. So I read Alan Bullock's history of Hitler. It was a definitive Hitler, you know, uh, biography of Hitler. It's about yay yeah, you thick, you know. There's a lot of demanding shit for it. But, but I gradually, every step of the way, if I got to a point where, you know, Hitler did something and I couldn't understand it, I couldn't put my, imagine myself doing it for the same motivations, then I'd stop and think and think about it and try. And eventually I, I cracked Hitler and I, I, I fully understood exactly where, where he was at. And I got to the end of Alan Bullock's biography. And, you know, this is Alan Bullock is still, I think, today recognized as the world's expert on Hitler, his historian. And I got to the end of it, and his closing thing was, the more he studied Hitler, the less he understood him. And I went, oh, fuck, that's, that's where I took that really badly, because I was like, I completely yeah. understood him. By the end of Alan Bullock's book, I completely and utterly understood Hitler. And, and so that really disturbed me. I thought, you know, this is the one that he doesn't understand, and the more, the more I understood, you know, studied it, the more I understood him. But, but... Yeah, it, it gave me a few sleepless nights thinking, oh, my fuck, what does this mean <laughs> that, I, that I understand? But I did that with everybody. I did the, exactly the same thing with Churchill and stuff. And then I, I gradually, you know, figured, figured shit out that way. But, yeah, that it's, it, you've got to put yourself in other people's sandals. All the, it's, all the stuff is an old cliche, right? The, the old, it's all about the old cliche. <laughs> The golden rule and turning your chin. It's all that crap. The problem is nobody can hear it. They're all platitudes and cliches. And, you know, you, you, everybody can say, well, you know, you've got to put it, you know, until you've walked in, you know, a mile in someone else's sandals, you can't criticize. There's like, it, no one can hear it now because it's all just bad, da, da, da. No one, no one actually goes to, no, no, Jew, no Jew I know has ever gone to try and understand Hitler. You know what fucking victory that would be? If, if you're Jewish and you're like Orthodox and you're really into Judaism and you go and you try and see and say like, okay, stop this demonizing of Hitler. Just say Hitler's an ordinary guy. How did he get where he got to? It's like, there we'll get somewhere. But 
people just just go like Hitler. <laughs> and and there is there is some Jewish there is some Jewish people who did analyze Hitler through the works of Alice Miller, who is a psychoanalyst from Sweden uh, from Switzerland, and she gathered in her wake a few studies on his childhood and his upbringing and it was on his personality more than his politics but there was some but it's it was very it, bizarre it, it, yeah but there's no understanding right they, they mm. just find why the reasons he was a monster and not me yeah. is really what it is it's yes. like saying like, it, nobody yes. writes a book saying i find i'm a jew i finally understand hitler yeah because he hasn't visited his shadow so i mean yeah. if you you know and that's the big thing but i i find that you're absolutely right because little groups like this on the internet like well kevin is a big group um but other groups like that tend more and more because of the COVID thing to continuously meet in this little closed uh identity uh exchange in and they don't there's less and less communication between different ways of thinking it's just App. It's to, like even Burning Pink yesterday. It was nice to hear people sharing their experience, but they were, you know, the thing about the prison and the fines and uh, XR stuff. It was nice to hear people actually talking about, but it was still, it was going unchallenged, unchallenged it, because they, they reinforce each other. They have, a, a, they have a narrative that they are following tacitly without even talking about it. And it's just, you, you have little signs of recognition to show that you belong to this kind of way of if you there's a few words that you will not say or a few things that you will not i, I i'm lucky my microphone didn't work yesterday evening because i was all geared up to, <laughs> to not put my foot in it but I, I i just you know i wanted to follow what you said about the dead stri the dead strike um, and they didn't seem to to pick on that at all do you know yeah it, it, it it was just basically a buddy fest, so it was, you know. But the same is with with Kevin is, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a locker room thing. It's a boys' locker room thing, and uh, I don't think he's got a single girl fo follower. So he's lost fifty percent of his audience just right there. I mean, I don't, I don't why? Why did you? Why did you lose fifty percent of his followers? Because fifty percent of of potential followers are women. <laughs> Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think a lot of a lot of what's going on here is uh, <laughs> the fact that we don't have an, any initiations anymore. You see, you used to have these phases, and you would do exactly what I'm doing is basically a kind of a birthing process into adulthood. But what the system has done deliberately is made people infantile for purpose basically the purpose is to groom them to be an obedient debt slave uh, so so they the system infantilizes people deliberately to make them obedient i know this because we did it in south africa i mean uh, i uh, my background i've mentioned many times and essentially i'm um, a latter-day slave owner that basically we kept african servants in peonage you know basically we we they weren't literally slaves because we gave them a stipend, but that stipend only bought the stuff a slave would have anyway. And, and that's basically, we gave them food and then they just had enough to buy clothes and a few essentials. So if, if they were slaves, they would have that same amount. Basically we spent less money on them uh, than if they were slaves because we didn't have the capital cost up front of buying them. But essentially they were bonded to us once. Once you had a, a servant, a male, um, a gardener or a female um, housemaid, uh, they were essentially bonded to you for life. They couldn't really, you know, they, they didn't have the option of switching their labor because it, so, it was so precious to have one of the jobs. So, so it, I, I'm just saying that they were, uh, you know, basically slaves. Um, uh, and worse, peons are actually in a worse state than, than slaves. But, but for we kept, uh, and I mean, we in South Africa and the the white uh, middle and upper classes, you know, the moneyed uh, whites were actually all whites were moneyed really. Um, we kept them infantilized, and and if you speak to people <clears throat> that saw the end of apartheid, is there was a definite point uh, where people realized <clears throat> that this was the end. 
this this was the end of apartheid and where the tipping point was when when uh black people stopped being infantilized so so they got to be a point you know basically the system reinforces that you must doff your cap and say yes sir no sir because because if you obedient that's the best strategy for surviving this intolerable trauma of peonage and slavery so so if you're obedient and you uh, subservient that's the best strategy so the system tries to force that as and reinforce that as the best path your best strategy in life is to obey and so then you know there's they build up a tradition in slaves of doffing the cap and showing subservience and going oh crap cowing and then that's the best survival strategy and it it works for the system because it's the least expenditure for keeping them under control so it's in in essence you show them the, the best strategy is self control and and then uh, so then you know the idea that they is reinforced that they're like uh, you know yes sir no sir and that's this this childish thing where they 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 try and act like babies it's it's basically a a pack wolf thing where the little cub you know lies supine all the time say like, oh don't you know and she bears its neck so it's this neck bearing thing that basically is is the best survival strategy as a black person in this intolerable situation and the system then reinforces that because it's cheap you know, it's cheap form of control so we knew that it was the end of the road when they stopped uh being subservient so i i was just talking recently in fact to a greek guy a greek south african um and and uh he he owned a gas station um and he said he knew the end of apartheid had come because there was uh this guy you know big boy africana um had got into an altercation with this black guy in a car uh and the the script that should have gone down you know this big you know this big fucking loafing <laughs> troglodyte um oh, oh, yes, uh, apologies people i'm very sorry and the only excuse i have was that i nodded off um can you hear, <laughs> hey, can I, you hear me we, we we are recording okay so just oh yeah, we are oh, yeah Okay, so but anyway, go, yeah, go ahead. I'm, we're glad. You, I'm glad you came on. <laughs> yes, I had everything uh, sketched out this afternoon. Um, been um, actually, funnily enough, looking at. Uh, oh, this is odd that I'm. I'm well. We're working on a platform extension for streaming, and uh, it's. I'm using that platform right now, and uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure why that exactly is, but at least uh, it seems to be working. We've got a real-world test in uh, why why that is. So um, that's that's kind of interesting. So I can um, I can tell my uh, network expert that his uh, ninja skills have worked. This is. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, you just yeah, can't can see me, you. right? We can't see you. You can't. We can't. Right. You, your camera's muted. Uh, right. Um, that's because I've got a thousand instances of this. Uh, what the back end of this software running that's using up the camera right now. Um, just bear with me to, and I I stop short the troubleshooting for this. Like I say, it's all it's all part of trying to get around the uh, the censorship that I have all this running right now. Okay. So just just on the on the censorship question, we we've got to find some code words for. for uh, I had to, had a had a good one earlier. Actually, I don't know if you saw the stream I did earlier with Kev Baker, but uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer for. Uh, uh, the Pfizer, uh -huh. and uh, um, I guess uh, uh, right. um, I'm, I'm, okay. so so the virus is just the virus, right? Uh, 
Yes, yes, um, <laughs> depends. And our uh, cousins in the Middle East, I don't know particularly what you would like to call uh, them. Which um, one? <laughs> no, I, I don't think. Are the are the? I mean, like the J I H A D is is not a no no. But but if yeah, Allah Akbar is okay, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I hope so. I use it. I use it a lot. I just said uh, it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's a keyword. I think um and uh, we're putting the list of the words to to code for because. I think the algorithm I've, I've picked on a certain amount, a big amount of words. I started doing a list of the words that we, and you started to put Greek letters in, in vaccine or in things like that. And I think that's very good. Even I, include, I think that was one. I think that V yeah. word is one. But to include, to include foreign fonts is enough to completely defy the, the algorithm because you can put an, a, a Greek letter or a, and I'm not going to say an Arabic letter, letter because it's a bit complicated, even though I have it on my uh, keyboard. But you can put um, Hebrew, Hebrew, Greek, whatever. Do you know? I don't know what you think. Yeah, there, are of, there are loads of things that will defeat the bot. But, um, yeah, just in general, I'm really, really pleased that they're starting the censorship because uh, yeah. this is this is exactly where we went in South Africa is, is – uh, it's a huge mistake. I can't believe that they're such amateurs at this game because uh, it's 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 such a rookie mistake they're making that it, you kind of wonder if it isn't like um, you know reactionary or it's it's deliberate. It's you know it's a COINTEL up because it, you, they surely they know enough psychology to know that people start developing their own keywords and stuff like we're doing now, which makes it a cultish atmosphere. There's cults 101 is to make your own lingo, to and build up these borders of separation. And so it's free rad radicalization for people. They're basically saying, now you have to radicalize. And you're like, thanks very much. I was really struggling to like, radicalize people before you. So it's saying, Hey, now this is forbidden fruit, which now basically makes it exciting. It's like, thank you. It's basically, hey, and it brings up the barriers. And it's like, well, couldn't have done it better myself. Thanks a lot. And it's so easy to get around and with little tricks and stuff. So you, what happens from here on out is you get into a dialogue with the state. And so the, the state st starts escalating and eventually figures out, you know, the bots will eventually figure out that people are doing And then it forces you to get cleverer. And what's happening is the, the Hobbes' Leviathan, or the resistance Leviathan, is getting smarter and evolving and getting more radical. And, and it's all good. It's all good. So thank you, Big Tech. I didn't know you were such a clueless fucking idiot. Well, you got the... Uh, in World War II, that's what happened in, in France. Uh, the codes, the, the radios, the, that's what made the resistance big is that Vichy started to censor everything. Every time in during the Algerian movement, every, every time censorship is, is going to... So you're right. You're right. It's completely, completely uh, playing in our game, anyway. Because I mean, I think so much more censorship, please, more censorship. Yeah, it, it, it's it's just human nature to say like, I'm not allowed to hear that. Yeah. It's like I have to hear that. Well, what is it? That I'm not allowed to hear. It's like, oh, that's uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry that's, to interrupt. That's very guys. ape. That's very ape. It's, can you can you guys hear me? You know, can, uh, can yeah, you guys? Can, yeah, we can. Yeah, I'm, I might have to reboot if I if I can't um, find the process that's holding the camera right now, which I'm not having much luck. Uh, it, it, don't don't sweat it. I mean, you you're coming across fine on audio, so it doesn't. Yeah, it, it's fine if you're actually on on muted camera. Uh, I'm just. Uh, I hate being defeated by tech like this. If, uh, if I can't, <laughs> if I can't beat this, then uh, what hope is there for the uh, uh, future? I, maybe this is it. But, yeah, and this is. I'm a, I'm a recovering engineer. It's um, the tech is hopeless. This. Uh, I think I have it. You'll drive yourself mad. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Trust me. Um, Hey, there we go. Uh, hey, you're on five bells now. Great. Yeah. 
Um, All the cylinders. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so just in terms of, I, I want to upload the video. So, so if we just try not to keyword ourselves into a YouTube takedown. Um, uh, yeah. Look, the key, the key things I know is uh, the, the Michelle Pfizer. Anything around that? Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, sorry. Um, they they will uh, take that down very very quickly. And I had a friend yesterday that had uh, three four channels taken out, even if they didn't have strikes, because he had been mentioning the um, Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, all all to do with Michelle Pfeiffer. So um, I be very very careful in in this respect and uh and that was that wasn't a live that was a sort of retrospective um banning and let's say he, his one of his channels was just uh he's he has he has a sort of fascination with um supernatural stories bigfoot things like that that didn't have any strikes and um they decided that he was uh that that was too much and so it was a punitive, um, know, punitive uh, takedown, I guess. Um, try to try to hammer the message home, which is uh, which is disturbing. And oh. the oh, you're gone. Sorry. I didn't... Oh well, I was going to move on to um, if there was. Uh, I don't know if you follow the case of uh, Owen Benjamin and Patreon and uh, they took him off right so he's being sued uh, in, Ca in Californian courts right now actually this is a glimmer of hope that um, they took him down not for stuff that he did on Patreon but for um, a joke that he said on Twitter uh, about the what was the example they give something something to do with uh, me too movement i think so uh, I, I can't remember the details of such but um but the tech companies are, are, are taking it upon themselves to police the internet in this fashion and um it was voter suppression right the, he he got uh, he he made some things about the the not debolt but the other guys who make the voting machines wasn't it and then they they sued him for Billions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, Owen Benjamin? No, it, his was just. Um, so his his story arc was one of he spoke out against them um, using uh, hormones on children, uh, puberty blockers, that type of thing. Um, he was, I, I, I don't know, relatively successful comedian in Hollywood. Was, uh, I mean, I've done a few streams about him. And I've had uh, people come and speak about him because he he went down this route of going at conspiracy th theories, looking at conspiracy theories, and sort of he was he would just rant in his back garden uh, about them. And uh, I, I sort of I followed it because of I'd seen him on Joe Rogan, um, and then he uh, he went with this. Um, uh, he, he started this, uh, he was, uh, well, <laughs> I can't talk because of Twitter, but uh, I've lost quite a few accounts now. But the, um, he would he would say that, you know, people people targeting children for the uh, the woke movement, uh, that, they, that they would think that children can make that type of decision. Um, uh, obviously not in the, they're not thinking correctly, and yeah, as alteration and stuff in in like prepubescence and stuff. Right? Yeah, it's and what what do you have? You have this oh bravo! It's stunning and brave as the children, um, as the children are mutilated basically, and um, well, it's a it's a form of psychological uh, psychological abuse, I would argue. And, <laughs> That that's probably the end of the road for 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 that for for woke. I mean that that is a no one's going to go <laughs> with this. This is a, a, a file you're not going to get out of, right? 
Mm -hmm. they, they really have gone beyond the pale on on this one. So well, it's, this is the limit. It's um, you would think so, right? But then, you know, I mean, I'm I'm critical of them a lot, but you know, with the some of the last holdouts in the UK was the Muslim community as they tried to uh, put in the books for um, same-sex parents and but primary school age. And I think this was in, I think it was in Birmingham. Um, and they, they had a, uh, they were, parents were striking basically and taking the kids out of school. And um, yeah, you, you know, it didn't get the news coverage that you, you think it would have with, um, uh, you know, you basically you were playing diversity poker at that stage, and you know who who was coming out on top. Uh, the um, well, the <laughs> they're not a minority Muslims, but I guess they are in the UK. But the uh, or those or the uh, the those who would engage in um, gender gender dysphoria, and th there's a very disturbing component in neuroscience which is using uh, the field of neuroscience and the plasticity of children um, as a as a, a battering ram to force through this sort of woke culture um, premise and um, it's it's a uh, how would you say hang on, hang on a second I just need to quickly it's a, yeah, I mean, the, the, the world recognizes phases when kids are growing up, right? They will go through gender dysphoria. So if you, you know, it's a, it's a kind of natural that you explore sexuality. But if, um, if you fix one by surgery or something like that, that's one of those irreversible steps that's just kind of un, unforgivable. Well, it doesn't, doesn't have to be surgery. And, you know, this is something that I've... I've spoken. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I don't have time to get into it, but you know, I know um, one of the sort of main protagonists behind this, uh, Daphna Uel. She's an Israeli neuroscientist, and what they found was was that there's um, they can look at functional magnetic resonance imaging on, and you know that this is. If, if you want to get into sort of like shooting down the theory, um, I can tell you that Tel Aviv is not the um, it's not the best uh, place for pulling a, a, a sample from, and um, especially in sort of younger uh, a younger demographic. Um, but you know, we we understand that um, there are there are traits that are expressed differently. Um, but in order, in order for you to get, you know, from the the child age to the male age, you know, you have this. You, you've got to be plastic to some degree because you, you don't know exactly what environment you're going to be popped into, right? And so, you know, there's a survival. There's some sort of survival there mechanism there that they're they're essentially keying onto. And you know, children children need to explore to find those. What's their, you know, what is what it what are, what makes them them? And they're using this idea that well, there's there's it's blurry this mosaic which seems to define male and female somewhat. It does cluster. You know, there are traits that are different, but because there's this plastic plastic stage in the young, they think that they can get in there and um it's the it's the right thing to do to uh, encourage children to ex explore out these things where i would argue that because it's so uh, plastic and malleable that's the time where you're where you should be making the differences as concrete as possible and it's a well it's it's a, it's a dangerous argument to be saying that we we know best with respect to nature and how they how we should be nurturing the nature of the uh, the well our, our children in this case and you've like I say we've seen it reach uh, peak absurdity with well you know, puberty blockers and 
uh, the pronouns and little children that are being put a, up in front of groups and um, you know the videos that you see are so disturbed well they're disturbing to me um, but when they when little six seven year olds are saying that they identify as uh, the other the other sex is um, yeah we've we've reached a point now where we're coming at well you think that coming at children the way they have so openly that that would be the point at which uh it would snap people out of the of of the woke well what you could do the monster it is because it's it's preying moloch it's it's moloch play, preying on children and oops. yeah I, I agree with with that so yeah, my my take on it is that you should be hands off at that stage. I was hands yeah. off it with, with my kids, and the, yeah. it's so what you're saying about exploring. Well, I th I think what the organism is doing is ex exploring its environment at at that time, and so you want to let it adjust to the the environment and whatever nature decided, and yeah. uh, the but they they enforcing the cultural narrative on on the kids development so i think it goes mm. both ways I, I don't think you want to intervene at that stage to reinforce one gender or the other it's no just no you should just let, let the children through. be um but you, you you need to set an environment that's conducive to making the roles that are necessary for propagation so for them to turn around and say oh there's you know so why are there so many more um how would you say sexually confused youngsters right now and uh, i would say this feeds into the nihilism you, you see a lot of this mental health disorders etc it's not that there's um so you, there's an argument that oh there's like 20 percent of the population is hom homosexual or of some sort of fluid uh interaction between those figures are absolute nonsense um, yeah. It doesn't. It's yeah. not something that we see replicated in the uh, natural world. Normal yes, you, world, can, yeah. you can. You can force pair coupling in in a zoo, for example, or in where uh, animals will lose out in the mating hierarchies. But um, the, given the choice, the, and you you offer a uh, you offer a. a, a proper mate in, in those circumstances yeah. usually nature nature will uh um follow the course and like i say we've been um well we've gone real deep real quick right to <laughs> this uh, with this uh, we we do that we do that it's allowed on yeah. us okay, so. <laughs> so, uh, on, on a light on a lighter note there was um where i live in ireland um there was a tradition uh that's went that lasted up until the 60s 70s because um some guys of my age got it is that when when the baby was born and uh until they were and the boy was born um in certain families especially in the fishing communities around here until they were about three or four they were dressed like girls they were put on little dresses and with lace and everything because the fairies uh, the fairies were known to come and take the boys they wouldn't leave they would leave the girls alone and they know it's just a little anecdote because uh i i've explored a little bit but i've explored a little bit the meaning of that and uh i mean it there's a lot of interpretation it goes back to old celtic you know traditions and the fairies and all that but i think it, it there's also a symbol in there of the ambiguity of children growing up and the, the different paths they can follow and to th this kind of protection from the fairies might be a protection from some kind of inter intervention that's too heavy uh, you know it's priests, just so interesting this catholic priests in ireland yeah, I, 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 it is a, it's a protection yeah. against the, the fairies are the, the priests fairies, the fairies i yeah but the fairies are it's different it's very different because the fairies here are like the devas in india the fairies the fairies are creatures of the land they're creatures that live in different in different hidden places and they can come out and attack people or take things but they, if you leave them alone they don't do anything to you and you can trick them so there's a lot of symbols in there you know it's a long it's it's not a subject of our talk 
But, uh, but my, yeah. by my way of thinking, all, all those kind of things are metaphorical, and they met metaphorical for the parts of our own brain. So whenever you see any kind of mythological thing, people are really talking about parts of our own psychology. Yeah. So when yeah. they say something like, um, you know, fairies, then everybody thinks, oh, mythical, mythological. And you should not. You should think more in, in concrete terms and think literally fairies. <laughs> and so you think like it's pr to protect them from the fairies. The fairies are going to do gender alteration. The fair That's exactly what the fairies in woke culture are basically harming these kids. So yeah. it's like this, it, you must think of it in far more literally than mythological. No, I know, I know. Put but a mythological yeah, yeah. spin on it because it makes it acceptable. And uh, but these these are fairies in like you know what what we would call yeah. fairies. <laughs> that, yeah. And Thanks. so it's, it's the same in Jewish culture that that they won't say uh, anything nice about a baby, because if you say anything complimentary about somebody's baby. You'll leave it open to the spirits to come and and, and grab it, but uh, but I, I just I just want to say, Kevin, that that it, uh, surely it's not uh, worth getting bent out of shape about this because it's it's a I mean apart from the ethical things about the kids, which is pretty awful, but this is a self healing problem because none of these people are going to read, right? I mean, what what you're doing in those circumstances is is it's a castration narrative, right? What they, in essence, doing is uh, turning all these kids, they're going to be turned female. I mean, if there's any, no, nobody gets little girls and really turns them into boys. This is all about getting boys and turning them into girls. And mm. in any way you look at it is a culture that does that. If they enforce the, that plastic stage and enforce woke culture on it, it, mm. it tends towards lack of breeding. So they're breeding themselves out of the population. Well, so, so that, that's so that's a difficult. Um, well, from from a sort of evolutionary and selective standpoint, it, it it's true that there's a constant um, churn of uh, maladaptive behaviour. Let's say, and it's you know, let's say one percent. I think it's probably more you know about that figure rather than the twenty percent. Um, so how do these people get, um, how, how does it keep propagating through the generations? And the, the, the obvious thing is that uh, it, it's through abuse and subversion that they, that they want, to, uh, want, they want to carry forward. And so that's why they, they, they come after your children. Um, but I, the, if, it were, if the numbers were twenty percent, that would that's enough to induce a population collapse, anyway. If their if their figures were were right, and um, right now, um, I, you know, I guess you know how how catastrophic is the nihilistic uh, trajectory that you know where's it going to sort of are we still arcing up on the uh, on the ballistic tra trajectory and then coming down, you know, at a even faster rate of knots, or are we, you know, is it more sort of uh, like rifle no, ballistic? No, no the, st the statistics are in. We're in a precipitous decline uh, in in the Western tradition. So if, if you take um, uh, Jewish people, I mean, I think the reproduction rate is is amongst. Um, kind of secular Ashkenazi Jews about 1.6, uh, something like that, which which is collapsed in three generations. Uh, uh, in Ashkenazi Jews, I mean that's not what I saw in Israel when I was there. They have well, the Orthodox. No, the Orthodox having... is the opposite. The Orthodox are breeding like rabbits. Mm. So the in in non-Orthodox Jews. Uh, they're basically disappearing very, very fast. And so it's, it's, it's a very strange narrative. I actually wanted to talk to you about this because, you know, you, you mentioned, I don't know if J-E-W, is, is that a keyword? J's. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I'm not so sure um, it's, it's that much of a, it, it, it depends what you tag onto it, right? And if, if you're huh. standing, if you're standing there, um, calling for their uh well yeah we get, we get it. <laughs> okay so okay it was, it was, so um uh but it, i i 
you know, the, the thing uh, I wanted to call you on is, uh, you know, mentioning, uh, but basically just on anti-Semitism because mm. is is I don't think there's there's any point because the for one thing they you know they're disappearing basically the this it, it's the strange thing about Israel is and Zionism it has no future just demographically because the the Orthodox Jews are are breeding. Uh, but the Orthodox Jews are very fast. So their reproduction rate is high. But there's so few Orthodox Jews now that the majority of Jews are really uh, in a population decline, extreme population decline. Mm. And so uh, there's no way that Zionists can hold on to Israel. I don't know why nobody mentions demographics in Israel. But the reason why the Israelis were doing this um, uh, dual use research, uh, basically sterilization, um, you know, female immunization to sperm. Um, uh, mm. South Africa was doing it on their behalf, and they basically it's a, an ethnic bioweapon. But the reason why both countries were doing it, because we were both in the same demographic uh, squeeze. And so it, it's not only the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, it's actually in Israel itself. There's so many Arabs now but they, they have to make a choice, sort of already, they have to make a choice, is they have to give up democracy or lose Israel, uh, mm. or they basically have, you know, bioweapons and stuff and try to reduce the population, which is probably already being left a bit late. So they, they, it is literally the end of, of Israel. Within, within three, three generations, Israel is gone. I, I think, well, I think so, so this is anyway, because a, climate change is going to get us, but I know you don't believe that. Well, <laughs> so, so yeah. I, I, I have this to add. Okay, it's very telling that Israel is the first Western nation that's showing all the um, the worst excesses of the what comes out of uh, the release of these dual use agents, which is the uh, digital tracking. So people coming into Israel now have to wear um, uh, tracking bracelets, oh, etc. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's all be it's so everyone that thinks, oh, it's the Jews in that context where it's a um, it's a blanket statement. I'm missing I'm missing the point uh, entirely. I think that you know if you want it, it's it's Pharisees if you want to sort of wind it back in history and they've they've continued for a long time and they those pharisees don't actually care that much they see other jewish uh individuals just probably a little higher up uh, the uh, the the scale than uh, the goyim uh, basically uh, just at a fundamental operating level um but like i say the people people thinking that um their um hey keep the noise down uh their um they're acting as a as a functional unit all in all in lockstep etc the only thing that they that they're doing is that they they have this uh, in group selection and i'm changing in group to lineage selection that and this just from listening to uh, brett weinstein the other day it's a better uh, it's a better descriptor than uh, in or collective um, uh, or those groups that work through sort of collectivism and the woke culture is in that uh, um, uh, type of uh, selection. And the... Uh, the sorry? Group selection. So there's right? gr groups, yeah, group selection is it's one way of doing it. But in group is a um it's 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 not as it's it's not as precise as the the idea of lineage selection right when because so what's that what when you say in group what does that what does that mean about people yeah, in your bowling like club me. or are you um or is there something more fundamental to it and you know lineage lineage um selection is something that's more fundamental it coins the biological better and that's that's the inherent component of or the paradox of Judaism, right? Is that one they masquerade as a religion of one step. The other is that they have a uh, inward looking um, 
uh, lineage selection pressure through the mother and so it and they don't it's not a, it's not a religion that allow or you can convert but it's very difficult and and so they've they have this selection pressure or the the lineage selection which enables them to build something of a buffer but there's a you could argue that there's a there's a kernel within that that let's for sake of example because it's you've got to be you need to be able to use language that's not too technical but that say that's a, a, a direct continuation from the pharisees those that uh, rejected christ for example and were the um if you believe the catholics were the uh, subject of God's wrath and the destruction of Jerusalem, etc., and they were dispersed. But they continued to maintain the the church or, or the religious aspect through. I can't remember the. Well, they, they money lenders, right? They basically they. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and. So, but yeah, go on. But okay, so so Jews are insular. Um, in orthodoxy, but the general uh, Jews are getting less uh, orthodox, and the secular Jews, particularly the ones in Western liberal democracies, they are uh, marrying outside the out group um, in an exponential rate. So uh, they they're not being preserved as an insular group. Uh, anymore in terms of um, ancestry and and lineage. Well, we've got to be out. careful here. Jews that are left, and there are fewer and fewer of those um, in in terms but of. It, but in uh, Israel, in Israel though, this is something that they. That it, this is the only country that allows this, right? You're not if you're non-Jewish, you're not allowed to marry uh, an Israeli in Israel. They make you go out out of the okay. country. No, no or, or or convert but if you you can marry but you have to go outside of the country get married somewhere else and then they'll kind of recognize that you're a couple to be established as a couple inside of israel okay so they they have they they kind of that they're forcing the selection pressure within the country itself in that manner and they're the only country in the world that that does that and is allowed to well you know muslim countries have the same with um you try marrying a muslim no, girl no, no, actually, no even in greece even in greece there's there's the opposite for the for the orthodox church the only the only the abrahamic religions are allowed in greece and uh, they also until recently you couldn't really marry a greek uh, that way it was, uh, yeah so but they uh, it's diluting. Okay, that kind of thing is diluting because the uh, in non-orthodox Jews, the rate of uh, basically having kids out of wedlock is about the same as in, or actually more than the uh, than than say secular Christians in Western liberal democracies. So the marriage uh, leading to kids is not uh, really a big thing except outside. Orthodox Jews. So, so don't really apply. It. So here's here's the um, so here's the view towards that that would say. So if you look at Agenda 2020, 2030, and like I said, I'm not saying I really ascribe to these particular um, viewpoints, but th there's a um, there's a push towards automation, and the the Technology for automation runs across all levels, uh, especially military. Um, with some of Israel's greatest, uh, <laughs> did you be careful where you put this, uh, um, that the- Israel's their, greatest hits, uh, Khashoggi is one of Israel's greatest hits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, he, um, but they're, they're uh, funneling um, US technology uh, to China, and um you know you, again this this would be an area that i would i would just defer to brendan o'connell to as i mentioned him last week um the belt and road initiative that this the, the idea that we're in this um uh accelerated environmental collapse i would argue is a 
warping of what's called the one health doctrine the idea that there's this um the human beings are this problem on the planet and once you once you understand one health you understand its origins in the bio warfare programs and it's got this very long uh pedigree and you you sort of see the the you know I'm not I'm sorry, i don't understand what you're referring to kevin uh i've missed a link there what what's mm -hmm. the link between um the belief of, of the the uh, the human responsibility in the in the environmental collapse and one health i sorry because i can you clarify uh, that for me? yeah so one 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 health is this um so i would argue that environmentalism that the creed of environmentalism the, the idea that um the ecosystems are on the point of irreversible decline is a is a is an extension of this one health doctrine which you see if once you start looking into the scientific literature it pervades all of it, uh, uh, ecological thinking and it's this idea that you're going to manage each of these you know it's a triad of uh, components uh, human environment and animal and um, you know it within the, their target zone is within the middle and it's it starts out as a um, as a who wouldn't want clean cleaner air cleaner water etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's uh, it takes one of those components and it can be weaponized like 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 bio you know uh, the biome can be weaponized that these these um these institutes are using and they've um, they've weaponized the information so much that they they want populations thinking oh there's no point in the future Right. And, and you can argue if that's coming to, you know, looking towards this idea of Agenda 2020, Agenda 2030. And, um, you know, I don't like to sort of um, say, oh, this is exactly the UN's doing right now, et cetera, with 2020. But with the, the world spun on its axis in 2020. Right. And they're they're aiming at manageable populations by 2030. Right, and how how are they going about this uh, managed decline? Well, you can take each one of those parts of the One Health doctrine, and let's like, say so just Google One Health, right, and yeah. look at the images that you start that start coming up, and then then start going into the scientific literature, and then see how it ties into groups yeah, like yeah. Eco Health and these. Uh, hang on. Hey, big boy. Yeah. Uh, Daddy needs you to play downstairs. But, you, but we're you... getting a bit off, off topic here. Yeah, so. yeah, it's 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 circuitous, but there's a there's a, a a point that I want to get to. So, okay. um, there's a um, there's this concept of the Belt and Road Initiative, right? So Israel is going to be or the 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 Jewish state so let's think lord rothschild and these types of bloodline families the users okay they want to pivot back okay. so they want to they want to divide up into power. this um, um eurasian yeah. supercontinent so china is the factory of the world that plan went perfectly with kissinger from the 70s okay we we gutted ourselves of all our industries and all heavy industries and everything's got moved off yeah, to um hey you quiet Okay. or go downstairs did you hear what i said uh, sorry about that um or so we've gutted ourselves of our industries and we, we turned ourselves into service economies and what well, usury economies right because it's all built on um you know usury, financial yeah, yeah oh, financial yeah. tools that make no make no sense but there's a, there's a core group that that are that are benefit from them enough go Go. Sorry about that. But, um, but the core group is is I mean Jews are overrepresented in that core yeah, group. But it's not they it's not it's not just people, Jews. Yeah. Though. They're overrepresented and it's not just it's not just Jews, unfortunately. And um right, people... right, but what's what's the common theme? Because what what I think the common theme is it's it's urbanization. If you're looking at your Pharisees and stuff like that, is is the urban environment uh, has centralized and uh, fast bred us uh, for a kind of psychopathy. And so the uh, you can measure it IQ. IQ is kind of an indirect re reference to psychopathy. 
Uh, and so I think this narrative that they have on the left saying, when, when you come to Ursary, right, they're, they're saying, well, Jews got into money lending because that was the only profession they were allowed. Right? You go back to Shylock and you go to the Merchant of Venice, <laughs> then they say, you know, well, it was forced on them because, you know, basically Christians were forbidden by the Catholic Church to engage in Ursary, so, but you could do it across religious lines. So. You know, the the guys were excluded from guilds, so then basically they got into Ursary out of desperation because there was no other way to earn a living. And so it's sort of like, mm. eh, <laughs> not buying it. <laughs> not, I'm not buying it. But, but, but there is an element of truth in it because, because I think outside of Eastern Europe, uh, Jews were forced into an urban setting. It, it, outside of... Uh, the the kulaks and things like that in in eastern in in russia and eastern europe that it, the the Jews Jews land land from, the, from the 13th century they were not allowed to own land in the country yeah right yeah but but that forced them into a service economy and uh, and basically into urbanization but i think it's it's urbanization that does it and so that's, if you look at the common thread, and I mean, okay, I'll, I'll tell you personally now that, um, yeah, if, if it took, I, I have no problem stereotyping <laughs> Jews because I think yeah. we've got to get beyond all this bullshit and get to the bottom mm. of this. I just share something personally because, you know, just, I mean, we, we're heading in such dangerous territory just discussing this. And I think, like, I want to try and show people that you can discuss this and it doesn't mean that, you know, we're heading for our switch. <laughs> it's basically, mm -hmm. I, I think we need to start really discussing openly and have discussions like this to show people that you can discuss these forbidden subjects without it turning into, you know, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I think well, the way I, we're that's... going with wokeism is the way to the Holocaust. It, it is the way to the next Holocaust. And I think if we, mm -hmm. unless we, we discuss this properly and, you know, first thing that's got to go, is this thing that this ban on stereotyping because okay here's my personal story is that my my dad uh, was a businessman and uh he was ruined by this jewish partner and he told, <laughs> surprise okay. so he told me he told me it's like don't go into business with jewish partners mm. I did it twice. They took me down exactly the same way. Basically, my, mm. my Jewish partners, they all the stereotypes, they, they ganged up. I was the goy. They, mm. it was, they, they acted like predatory animals, like a predatory mm. pack. And they took me down legally, not, not because uh, they had any legal case. They basically, it was predatory legislation. They basically use it as a tactic to arm wrestle you into the ground. So they, they yeah. took over my company. So, yeah. so, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm not prejudiced. <laughs> and right. so basically I got taken down twice. So you would say that right. I'm, if, if there's anybody who's supposed to be anti-Semitic, it, it should be me. But right. I don't see it that way. You see, I, I was taken down by another partner, much the same way, who wasn't Jewish. But he was kind of uh, the Jewish stereotype. He was kind of Shylock by, by accident, not by British. Right. <laughs> he was an English guy. And in every single case, the way I came down to analyzing it is if you go further back, take it into prehistory, this kind of behavior doesn't happen in hunter-gatherer societies. I mean, hunter-gatherer societies are very diverse, but mm. this kind of predatory behavior uh, just, just isn't there. And where it comes in is, is urbanization. So mm. I think that uh, what's to blame and where it really pops out is is like in from Gobekli Tepe, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, you can see it going through Sumer. And then by the time you get to the Pharisees, they are an offshoot of these, uh, you know, urban urban mindset. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it, it, so, so if you follow through with this, it's saying that it's the urban mindset, which, which I'd call like the alien cortex is my phrase for it. But let's say that the Jews are more urban. The uh, Ashkenazi Jews uh, score very, very high in IQ. And IQ is kind of a, a way of measuring how urban you are. Um, if you want to be politically correct and people, you know, hate IQ you know, on the left because of uh, Isaac and stuff, uh, they, they, they just shoot him down because it's too politically charged about IQ. 
but mm. they they claim that an iq the the politically correct way to get around the difficult subject that jordan peterson goes into and stuff but about iq is to just say well it's a measure of how modern you are well we increasingly urbanized and and the modern equates to basically urban so we're breeding ourselves in this kind of fast breeder reactor and it's all based on this attraction towards an urban center so if you follow that through you say yeah it's the urbanization is the problem and it just so happens the jews are more urbanized so they they show these trays more so what, what do you think of that uh well again uh, how much is nature and nurture and how much look i've i've been burnt by uh my um by the traits that you're describing whilst in israel which was um there was this uh let's say the lineage selection and they didn't they didn't mind taking and stealing stuff that wasn't theirs if they thought it was sort of propagate them uh forward and um, oh, Lebens realm. They, they believe in Lebens realm, which is the most <laughs> ironic thing. Most of yeah, and like I say, the the paradox of uh, jury is playing out right right now uh, in the uh, in front of our screens. They they are the ones that have been got have been essentially forced into mass vaccination. They are the ones that are being forced into um, carrying uh, the. Uh, passports and basically having to live as uh, a second-class citizen in their urban environments. So, what are what are their big urban environments? It's, there's Tel Aviv, there's Haifa, and uh, Jerusalem, and there's not there's not that much else in terms of uh, big cities. They're sort of conurbations generally of Tel Tel Aviv or. Um, yeah, but I, I have been to Israel too, and I, I what you say about urban uh, concentration is right, but. The whole state has an urban mentality. The country is tiny. Uh, if mm. you go to, you, it, there's not, I mean, apart, you can talk about the kibbutz, okay, but that's a tiny, tiny little minority of collective experiences over there that I visited actually. But mm. with the, 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 you know, the size of the country you're talking about, tiny. you're talking about, you know, it, it's all urban in, as in urban way of living. There is, mm. even in the, in the tiny little towns, people don't have a rural lifestyle. They don't have, they don't have a community collective mutual aid nothing like that it's all mm. centralized and that, that's mm. i think am i you know i think I, I i that's what you were meant you about urban too didn't you yeah yeah exactly yeah the kind of, to, to sum up what i'm trying to propose here is is just in terms of of your channel and basically your project is i think in, in to, saying stuff against jews is hiding to nothing because it, basically, it's an ethnicity, and they can, nobody can change their ethnicity. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I try to use it more for the way when comedic. You think is, a, is an idea. So, mm. so go after the idea because people can change uh, their ideas. Zionism is basically Jewish fascism. It's basically it's the you know not even the other side of of Nazis. Basically, mm. the, the the Zionists are Nazis. Uh, but you know the folk is Jews instead of Germans. That's the, but they're national socialists. But mm. so so go after Zionism, which is an idea, and it's an idea that's falling out of favor. In in increasingly in America, uh, Jews are, are not supporting the Zionists. They they're getting more and more disillusioned with Zionism. So the idea is going, and that's a damn good thing. But it's, there's no point in, in focusing on ethnic Jews because they can't change their ethnicity. And no, uh, it's, it's, it's I, I, I tend to come at demographics, it. so they, they, they're, being, they're being whittled down anyway. So, yeah, so, so just I, go I, I, um, don't go for Jews. It's the, um, it's the uh, shock factor and, and comedic factor for me. I, I, I know I'm with you that I, it's the, it's the idea of um, Jewish Lebensraum uh, that's the uh, the problem here. That and but the, the, there's a there's a correlate a corollary to that, which is they got their Lebensraum, right? They're great at Israel. They achieved it. It's not that it's not the footprint on the ground. It's the footprint in the air, right? Greater Israel exists in the air because it's their ability to project 
their air force over at, at as they see fit where they where they want to and engage with um other elements that they would want to uh, that, that they would rather stroke uh, stoke tensions with but again this is this is where you've got to get into the modern um the 21st century of thinking and about how much is about the belt and road initiative and the pivot towards china and how israel wants to be sitting at the middle of this um you know the bunting clover leaf map and you've got your asian supercontinent africa and the southern state uh, the southern hemisphere and then uh, the american north and south america as the other uh, leaf of that map and it's um Benjamin Netanyahu is up there now talking about Israel being a global uh, superpower in terms of uh, um, spying, or, or, you know, like the five eyes. Are. And he he's up there saying that um, they might not be number one, but, that, you know, they're 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 sort of number two, number three. And so now there are there are six I nations and. You know, a lot of um, so the, the server technology being built on is, is built on Intel backbones, essentially across the globe, and all these, uh, all of those chips are backdoored. Uh, there's a little, uh, it's, uh, it's there's a little uh, it's in, under in the, the BIOS. Of everything, yeah, it's it's basically the, yeah. There's there's this. I forget what it's called. There's something something uh, ME. It's called. It's it's like Intel yeah, ME. Micro edition, uh, so basically, the Intel Micro Edition is basically the micro code inside the chip, and mm -hmm. but so the since the beginning, those chips have been uh, had backdoors in it, and that's mm -hmm. why the the. the, the What's going on with 5G and that is is a technology war. There's basically there's this cyber war that's going on, and, and it's very difficult to make uh, CPUs and GPUs. Uh, you, you need a long run up. The technology that Intel has got is such a, a broad lead that China can't catch up. So what their strategy was was they would go into telco and start doing 5G and telco chips um, and then kind of circumvent the CPU uh, hegemony. But the undercurrent of all this is that all those backdoors that mean everybody knows in the in the military that we're going to war, and the 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 reason why we haven't gone to war yet is because they're sorting out this chip war, and basically everybody knows that day one of World War Three, uh, everybody sw flips a switch and finds out how basically embedded they are in each other's chips, and planes start falling out of the sky because they haven't been able to get like a fighter jet like the F-22, mm. that's completely free of, of compromised technology. So they can't mm. go to war because nobody knows how many backdoors uh, there are in this kind of software. But they're sorting it out. The danger of 5G is stuff and the chip war. This chip shortage that's going on now is mm. because um, of uh, espionage. They're basically they, they're trying to separate the two out. It's very bad thing because as soon as they separate it out, you assume that China's going to go and invade Taiwan. Well, but this, this, this is the thing that um, when and when you start understanding when you put when you put the lens of the Belt and Road Initiative on, okay, so you you see that um, Russia, China, and Israel are pivoting one way, and the the stands are part of the um, a part of that infrastructure and those trading routes. That are going to come through or the plan is to come through um you know they've got land sea routes etc and you know the uh, is israel sort of sitting at, at the center of it and there was um it wasn't that long ago that uh it's, it's been so out the headlines for a few months i've forgotten his name but the secretary of state pompeo went to israel and said hey uh there's you, you've got to knock it on the head this um this shift towards china that you're making right now and it's known that it, it, israel has is sitting at the at the heart of part of this at, at a lot of this espionage so there's the there's a program called uh, the talpiot program which is um it's aimed at graduates within israel and unit 8200 and these these are they're creating these uh, startup tech groups and they're, they're getting everywhere and they're getting into these CEO positions but then they're, they're military trained they've come out of a military 
uh, training and background and you know how much how much of that plays into um the the the, the extension the thousand year uh right for the i don't know what you would call it for the for for, for, for yeah. zionists yeah, yeah. but the, um so the, the, the Zionist Reich can't happen because of population demographics. They, they've lost that, that battle. Increasingly, this battle that they're fighting is, um, is a pyrrhic victory if they make it. So Israel is essentially uh, non-aligned in, in the sense that they just play everybody off everybody else. They basically mm -hmm. they, they just uh, allies of convenience. But it, it's not China and... Uh, Israel, the Belt and Road is, is Xi Jinping's initiative. It's not, China never initiated any of that. China's aligned with the, with Saudi Arabia. The nexus is Saudi Arabia, China and America with, yeah, with, but, but, with Israel in the lead. Israel, Israel dominates that, that, uh, that axis of evil. But, but you it, can, it's you can Iran, see... Russia, China increasingly that's on the other side of the Cold War now, the new Cold War. Uh, yeah, against so they they will. The idea is to buckle the United States, the West, and you know Israel has. You know the argument goes that they've managed to in, in, integrate themselves into so much infrastructure. Look, like the cloud computing aspect, the Jedi cloud computing for the the Pentagon, and how that was, and I think that got stopped uh, potentially. But uh, so so it's so no, fast they, moving when. No, the AWS hosts most of the the U.S. government stuff now in in its own cloud. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's all gone ahead. Yeah, in in Amazon. So, um, and you know, what's Jeff Bezos? He's Jewish, right? So, um, these are uh, these are um, these are existential factors playing out right now that we're that we're essentially we're we're looking we're looking at the battlefield emerge and um SARS-CoV-2 has a uh, has too much of a fingerprint of a dual use agent to be to just be ignoring it as a uh, um a, a, a zoonotic spillover okay so we the, the the game theory approach to take right now is to assume the worst and the the two the two phase component of SARS-CoV-2, which is the acute phase and the potential um, prion, prion genesis component, which is... Uh, oh, uh, for the keywords, care for keywords. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, I think that one doesn't, doesn't strike uh, home too much. They don't, I don't think they've uh, keyed in on prions too much. And uh, well, you know, the, the best um, dismissive that they've had, which have, you know I've sort of come up against, was the science-based, evidence-based medicine or something like that. David Gorsky, uh, Gorskin, Gorsky. Um, but you know their their attempt at sort of deflecting, you know, the any interaction with uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is the is the fact that. The current um, the current state of Michelle Pfeiffer that doesn't involve anything with bovine serum in that could that could in any way lead to people's understanding of what uh, a prion could be, and it's we're, we're way more sophisticated than that right now with respect to the um, what we understand with respect to how they how protein misfolding begins to instantiate itself in the in the body in the nervous system and like i say i think we discussed this last week which was that um pre prions were the, are the um holy grail of bio warfare development because of this slow burn fuse the problem was that you couldn't in order to have them spread it meant getting them into the food chain if you wanted to if you wanted to have a sort of mass effect on on the population whereas now it looks like they've got it into an aerosolized form which is what all bio warfare was about right you know the classic being anthrax was that they had to get it into a a, a sort of non 
so it wouldn't stick yeah, together by dispersal is the major problem with bioweapons. Yeah. Aerosol and, dispersal and, is the biggie. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and they've defeated that now with prions. If you can if you can engineer a prion genesis site into into a protein that's widely expressed and is contagious. Now now we've now the game theory says okay this is this is full on right now but we're we're engaged in this um silent warfare right and we're the the, the manifestation of it at, on the at the public level where civilians are we know civilians are a legitimate target in warfare right <laughs> that was established long time ago right we and um, when the gloves come off the um the how how would you say the it dogs me ethical, <laughs> well no but i want to say it's like ethical there's this idea of just and ethical warfare the utilitarian thing that the ends justify the means right yeah and you know the um, well so it's like dresden done. dresden being the prime example or you know they didn't yeah, need to Harris, they said yeah. yeah we're all justified by the the outcome it's it's this consequentialist argument yeah they, they are consequentialists mostly in the establishment <laughs> so, so in the one percent right but and so, yeah, so, so so i i got i got to tell you something that that i uh, i'm not an insider but uh i've i've uh, got I had a very unusual career, and I've got close enough uh, to um, have had a look behind the curtain. <laughs> and so, mm. so you've got some things right, and you've got some things wrong. I can tell you where your blind spots are uh, because I've I've heard of uh, what you said. The thing, one of the things you've got uh, completely wrong, as far as I know, is you said uh, that they're trying to distract us from the long term view. So basically, you're saying don't look at climate change in the long-term view, because uh, all these things that are happening now, like the pandemic, are um, just uh, basically, you know, things like uh, climate activism is supposed to take your mind off the planet. You got it exactly the upside down. But they're trying to take um, our attention off the long-term view. So the planet, uh, the pandemic, in a way, is. If I mean, I, as far as I can tell, I would I would put money on it being an accidental leak of illegal dual use uh, technology from the Wuhan lab. But if in, it if in, it in the best of circumstances, in, in the, the best, best of but, but I think that is the I would I would put my money on that. But if if it is a deliberate re release, right? Then hmm. the the reason why it would be released, the most credible reason, is they're trying to take people's. Uh, mind off the the future th and also training training us for what's coming down so so what i've i've seen over the the last decades i never had a, a u.s security clearance and in some ways i it served me better i i got to find out more without a security clearance than i think i would have um if i had a security clearance but the uh what's been What's been going on is that they they realized quite long ago that we, we were seriously fucked. And I mean, it came out of uh, the research from the cyberneticists, the guys like uh, Forrester and all of those guys, um, Norbert Wiener. Uh, they did all this modeling for basically the trajectory of, of the human system and the Earth system. And it came out, and particularly things like the Club of Rome and stuff came out with the limits to growth. So, uh, you know, after Ehrlich and the population bomb and stuff, they started looking at it in earnest and, and modeling it. And there was a, there was a big change um, around about 1989, about the time when Maggie Thatcher was addressing the UN. There was a big internal change in the system. So, so that, uh, Maggie gave a speech about the future of uh, the planet, environmentalism. Uh, to the United yeah, Nations. He busted the unions. Yeah, I remember it very, very clearly. And no, no, um, no, no. But that, that was just a local thing. In but the repercussions of that speech in the United Nations was big. I mean, what what came out of that was the IPCC. So, um, but it's very interesting what she said in that speech because I've done a video where I actually juxtaposed uh, Greta Thunberg uh, giving. 
exactly the same speech in 2019, standing in essentially the same podium at the United Nations. She said almost exactly what Maggie Thatcher said, word for fucking word. It's it's spooky mm. if you, you know, edit them in together. Uh, mm. the, the big difference was then, you know, Greta at the end got anti-capitalist and Maggie Thatcher said, you know, it's basically um, corporations and uh, business has to solve the solve the climate crisis. But, but around about that time, there was a big sea change in internal. And I think what happened was they, they ran all these models and they said there's no way out. They came to the conclusion that we all fucked around about that stage. So as the IPCC got launched, it became a vehicle for uh, panic management, and essentially. It's, it's just to delay the, the science, to give everybody, it's basically to under-report the, the climate situation. So the, one of the things you've got drastically wrong <laughs> is uh, the climate situation is very, very bad. Um, I haven't, I haven't it. seen anything like the, the climate argument. But one, you have to understand this One Health doctrine and the weaponization of that that concept. And very few people, even have everyone heard of One Health uh, until within the last few months. Okay, and how that ties into the into the weapons uh, development that's that's been going on since the Second World War. So it's, you're right that there's a curation component here and how much is globalist etc and in terms of raw data okay sea ice um gases in the atmosphere with respect to public science there's nothing there's nothing there that says to me we're we're outside the realms of anything that we haven't seen on the planet before when we're when we're looking at um at the measures that we do have be it tree rings be it ice cores um there's there's no there's nothing even even the worst scenarios of, of runaway climate change with uh, anthropogenic co2 nothing nothing look at a hundred thousand year time frame and human beings we know homo sapiens have been on the planet 300 well, years. well that's that that's true but what's what the concern is is growing crops um uh yeah and, so that and changes extinctions um, and and species extinction yeah. insects birds mm. i mean that yeah, is that is raw data that is not when i don't know what one health says about yeah, so, I don't so know. that's that comes that comes into this idea of you know the well so you know it's funny it's funny let's use eco health as an as an example that we we can look at but because we know it's shady in the way that it operates okay eco health is trying is, is going around saying that human beings can't go out and live how they uh how they have done naturally and go and eat pangolins for example if you live where pangolins are right um because eating bush meat is bad for you whereas at the same time palm olive is funding eco health alliance and they're literally they don't care about the environment in this case it's just it's just covers and fronts to um manage perception as it were as they as you know, everyone should know who palm olive is and what it is that they do for and how they got started and um you know why why are we listening to these people with respect to um pandemics okay when we can we can see that they're not only wrong they're they're part of the problem which has caused the the if we if we go down a accidental leak uh, hypothesis which is the best best case scenario for the game theory uh, analysis okay that it was accidental they they went out into the into the jungles of southeast was not forests i guess of um southeast asia they sampled the bats they brought them back to the lab and they did the gain of function on these um on these uh viruses which they're isolating in the wild we know that they're talking about nipper virus all the time and you, you've got uh peter dazak on record saying well we get these outbreaks of nipper but it gets absorbed by the background illness that you see that's just endemic in the country it doesn't it doesn't seem to sort of break out but we but, know that they're they're doing gain of function on nipper right but, but so we're, if, getting, we're getting off topic so the, the no no it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna, it's gonna it's gonna come round. it's gonna come round to the it's going to come around to the the climate aspect so these people are the ones saying um, they're trying to curate the 
uh, climate with respect to this uh, this idea of uh, species diversity of species the the farmlands etc look coastlines change on a long enough time period that okay if if crops change there's a reason china's buying up huge swathes of of uh, africa right they they're investing heavily in africa because you know what their culture goes back thousands and thousands of years and they keep bloody good records right and they they they've probably got an understanding of the cyclical nature of what does come and go um and i would i would argue that's probably more um nature based whether pick your pick your uh you know if be it volcanoes or some sort of solar event or whatever you want to sort of put your your finger on i don't the, the idea that it's humans itself that's causing that the we're the driving mechanism of that i, I think it's it's a hey, it's, um um kevin so what i'll do after after this zoom talk i'll link you a video of this professor named sid smith he has all the data and he breaks it down like the primary productivity of the planet and how much humans are actually consuming mm -hmm. how much how much wildlife is actually left on the planet i'll give you yeah. i'll link you i'll link but you we, that video in the discord after the talk and you can watch it's like an hour long i've, I've seen it i know i know the data but we can we know that there are that, that there are extinction level events all the time go back you can go back 10 uh 10 12 000 years and we lost all the megafauna across um the north african uh not, it's north american continent we don't know why the the idea that um uh human beings hunted down all that all that megafauna with uh um clovis spear tips is is a nonsense that's that's the type of uh narrative that gets pushed by well woke. well it's it's no it's not a no it's civilized humans with advanced technological ability we're literally like eating the planet with our technology and our numbers that's so what listen, that's what it boils down to so listen to hugh when he says that once the urbanization takes place and the material needs start happening there's a there's a tendency towards civilizational or, or population collapse now I would put forward the premise: What are we looking at right now? As these as these people who have the power, and like I said, we don't even we only know the public face of them. Okay, if they if they think they've got the technology to automate everything, where they don't need the factories and they don't need they only need so many people around to take care of their yachts and to make sure that there's a feel of uh, the the leisure um, existence right the, the 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 countryside has has some life in it right i'm, I'm pretty sure that they don't want to um you know get get down if the 500 million number is a real number i don't know but the uh, you know the georgia guides don't know i think it's real i think it's real at least in some sectors yeah it's a, so it's not monolithic right so um the thing that uh, the, the the one health thing is 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 just one of many things that are very similar. The uh, you're missing a large piece in the financial uh, industry. Oh, it's, it's financial. It's the, all of these things. But I'm I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to address this idea of environmental collapse. Um, I'm. Um, yeah, no, it's it's real. It's it's driving it's driving the elite. It's the bit you're missing. The, so they they figured out long ago that collapse is, is unavoidable. I can't pinpoint exactly when I've looked into it, but the and it's it's difficult because it's not just one group. I mean, if you take something like the Pentagon, there are lots of factions and competing ideas. Mm -hmm. But the the One Health is just one part of something like the World Economic Forum and, and Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset. They're all in many the one world order there there are very many strands that kind of converge on mm, this yeah um it's not just one organization uh, no no, no it, they're very very similar so you have to but i mean it's it's more than one 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 health if you if you know what i mean yeah even, not, I don't, 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 don't misunderstand Europe, me of, of of the one health being the 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 one key to or the one ring to rule them all it's but the, the you have to understand how we how the information has been weaponized uh in 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 this day and age okay so environmentalism is, yeah, no, is i do i do i do i do but but the, the point you're missing here is 
is you you have to bring uh, the evidence for, for, for what's for what's um what what's a natural cycle versus what's um how much is really man man-made so we can look we can look at carbon offsetting right and um the fact that uh the united states has crippled the west has crippled their economies by going for this carbon neutral um type of economy not using fossil fuels but what all that does is empower countries like china and india to undercut and um they they are polluting and i'll, I'll tell you again that this this whole idea of um the at the atmosphere being irreversibly uh polluted it took days for the lockdown in china for things to clear up right the smogs to disappear when they when they locked down their country and wuhan was one of the worst cities for uh you know where, where you would see people you couldn't see 300 yards because of um industrial smog and it's so bad when i was in korea there was just a yellow tinge all the time in the sky whereas if you go a few hundred miles to the east japan just has these deep blue azure skies you know the difference is striking within this last year we've seen that that disappears overnight right the um the the the, the stopping of uh high altitude commercial flights had a had a measurable impact on on the environment within days to weeks the, all none of those projections that i've seen have managed uh, have crawled their way to something that i would say is anything more than correlation okay so and would you agree with it would you wait, wait, Sophie, let me let me speak here so Sorry, so yeah, would you agree that deindustrialization would be would be on the on the agenda so if you if you notice such a thing do you would you be a a proponent that, that human beings if they don't want to be blamed by blamed for an, for uh, climate change and global warming should totally deindustrialize totally um, no <laughs> do i do i think we should shoot ourselves in the foot while our enemies are, are arming themselves to the teeth and have all their industry no i don't <laughs> that's that's a, that's a, that's a naive way of um of looking at the world and um big as big pieces are being made on the chessboard right now okay and i just look at them as mob type factions and they they will use their populations as they see fit and behind look when the allies and the the, the axis nations went to power uh, went to war there were groups behind those countries that we can look back in retrospect and say oh they were playing both sides right and the, the same the same heuristic is at play right now okay so um show me climate models that really take into account the proper nature of the sun and the earth's interaction with the sun that take into account like we're going into a uh, into a minimum right now a potential more than minimum so, that's on yeah, yeah. um and no, but if where, you're, so, so you're preaching to the choir on all this. I mean, we're, yeah. we're in violent agreement, but I'm trying yeah. to get through to you, and I don't think you're listening. So, the uh, in terms of the climate, there's not yeah, the link is uh, okay. So you you understand the climate is changing. You understand that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Of course, yeah. Okay, but now the question is: Is it anthropogenic? And I I will vehemently uh, argue against that point until it. You've got to use hard science at this at this point so, not so, subverted yeah. science out of look i'll give you uh um uh article one east anglia university and the hockey stick graphs right and how how they yeah, call cooking their code yeah, yeah. i'll grant you all that yeah 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 but but here's the thing is the so does it really matter if it's anthropogenic or not what what's the issue um well it's it depends on the 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 defensive posture that you take right so if it's if it's part of a natural cycle okay the idea that the idea that we should be one that the, the nihilistic view that's been injected into our youth right that they they they're frightened about the idea of having children and on multiple levels one because we put them into massive debt two because um we've just subverted what the the core basis of what it means to the, the building block of uh, culture and society which is the family and you 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 instantiate an existential fear in 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 our youngest 
that's that's you playing directly into the hands of those that um want want you not to um not to go into the next generation right so let's, let's agreed agreed but what's that why it doesn't explain why it matters whether it's anthropogenic or not i mean if it's natural you would still be nullistic at this point why is um, what's what's the big deal about it being anthropogenic or natural it's basically if if it, if it's naturally tending towards collapse and we we're in a climate crisis naturally who gives a fuck um see the the way uh, i think it is at the moment is it's anthropogenic it's it's us it's you you're right that it's only correlation they can't really prove a causation but the correlation is strong you're never going to get uh, proof of causality but the the uh, co2 the greenhouse gases the uh, their concentrations are going up in coordination with them uh, like the models are <coughs> bullshit okay <clears throat> i'll grant you but the the fact is that um, the the greenhouse gas concentrations are going up with the temperature, and that's that's solid. So the correlation is solid. The thing is that there are a number of points on this. Is the correlations are very very strong. I mean, forget Michael Mann and the hockey stick graph. They they are very very strong, and they're happening too rapidly. So if you look at the stuff that uh, you made a statement that's quite wrong. Uh, basically, the the solar in one of your previous videos. You said something about uh, you know basically the solar forcing is not included. Yeah, it's included. The IPCC. No, it's 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 not. Report. It's not because you don't. You, they're just taking a radio. In the IPCC report. Yeah, it's but, they, in the but that's the IPCC report. They can't right, but, but they're, they're, they're not. They don't they, understand wait, the sun. I, 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 it's 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 a, it's a non it's a, it's a, it's a non argument it's view. In the IPCC view. Yes, I know, I know. I know. I know. They take. Can I fucking finish? Okay. It's in the IPCC report. They, they, it accounts for about, I, I'm not sure the percentage, but something from memory, something like 25%. But it, okay. it is in there, right? So, it's a drastic, it's a drastic simplification of what the sun is doing and the Earth's interaction with the sun. Okay. Yes. We, yes. We, we yes. know, we, we know is. that um, uh, UV output from the sun is only just one metric okay there's this whole there's this whole concept that the earth itself yeah. is just is is floating in a gravity well not connected to the sun and it's it's some higher dimensional construct that's keeping it in place yes, whereas yes, we, yes. You're, we you're all right on this the bit that you've got wrong there is it doesn't account for the temperature right so so the correlation between the solar activity and the the uh, basically Milankovic cycles and all of that kind of stuff is uh, they don't account for the heating. If you want to account for the heating, it's it's becoming increasingly obvious. So, so how are you measuring the heating? Uh, from satellites, so basically satellite imagery, and uh, and so that I can I can go through and I can I can find hole after hole in or every every bit of um measurement and how they're doing those measurements and how it's being used to weaponize the information with respect to what you understand to be climate uh change okay the heating yeah, the, there is the, hole uh, after hole but that doesn't that doesn't negate it you see see the problem is here that it's a very very complex system and yeah. you can very quick before the cows come home. It, it's it's basically there's too much information in some ways, and in some ways there's too little. So there's there's nothing definitive, and there won't be. The problem with that is that even climate scientists, then uh, looking at the data, they get to a psychological barrier because uh, there's it's too much data for one human to assimilate. There's something like two thousand papers uh, produced sometimes every week on climate there's far too much data so so what it means is and skewed, skewed data cherry pick the data and so you're never going to get a, a uh, an outcome what happens is it starts the more you look at it it starts to look worse and worse from more and more angles and eventually how much you can actually absorb of the information becomes psychological your personal psychology is how much of this it's it's very very bad picture and so people get to a stopping point that's what uh, climate scientists are facing um uh, basically a denial of collapse so when you look at this the data is saying collapse now that that's 
it's just a, an aggregate that's hard to get to without a lot of study. How much people so, will I, again? So this is based on human psychology. So again, I would I would look at it like this way. So we've got a great example in SARS-CoV-2. Papers are being churned out in the hundreds of per day with SARS-CoV-2. Why? Because right now it's incentivized with money. Right. So the more the more that the, and this is the problem with science, that the, there's a loss of the um, of objectivity that comes that, yeah. that comes with uh, once you start incentivizing a research direction. Climate change became the and the green. Look, they want the green ideal because it's a cudgel to to control humanity. OK, this and that's why I point to the One Health Doctrine. Okay, so that's the that's the that's how they'll bundle you into the cities. That's how they'll get you under uh, the the tracing, etc. And that's that's how they'll bring in the automation. And then they'll say, um, you know, the, the, the jobs aren't there because we're um, we're automating, etc. So we don't need these large populations. They they don't mind having a controlled burn, right? Of um, but, but I agree with you on all this. It's well, you see the bit the bit that's. Uh, and I, I I disagree with you about the 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 environmental collapse. I'm not. It's 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 a natural cycle. And the 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 finish to that argument is well, we can see that there's an eleven to twelve thousand year cycle. We've been here for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, and and the the idea that um we should just stop and say fuck it or delve into um reckless hedonism is um it, it's short-sighted we could we've got we've been given the evolutionary tools to move forward through this and it comes from the more you know esoteric or religious type doctrines that shrink down don't don't get too big that you're 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 pushing the edges of the what your ecosystem can can sustain right so um but we're all in violent agreement on these points. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's just I'm I'm not I'm not um, I'm not as convinced that the um, the the natural the, the, I don't think it's it's a man-made uh, cycle, right? It's natural. Then um, but, but the, why would it matter? Why would it matter if so? So okay, if so you we say need, we need it's, people to get through. It is natural. Where does it end up? I mean, where where. Where is the Earth sensitivity? In, in, I mean, you agree that the Earth is heating, right? That's um, not a matter. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, very skeptical of the heating data being pushed out when it's being used to um, look. In, in our lifetime, it's gone from uh, we were going to have, uh, we were heading towards an ice age to we've got runaway heating to now we're going into another minimum etc and all what i see is i see um incentivized professors and organizations like eco health that's a eco health is a good one to to focus on because we can see how corrupt that is well, and how it how it feeds from each side well well that's the thing with with state science and propaganda you can take the fact that the earth is heating you can do whatever narrative you want with it but I, you know i'm convinced that the earth is heating but you know you can take the earth is heating see the data say oh we're fucked but no there's hope because we got green technology you see you can you can take a fact and lie with it you mm. see I, I, i'm not yeah, but, disagreeing with thing you. On, the, on the right you see i've got i've got a a friend who's like a one percenter but he's openly a fascist right he's, he's like really far right um, Run and salute to that gentleman. He says, hang on a minute. He says that, uh, you know, this uh, common narrative on the right that saying, well, no, all this thing about uh, environmentalism and climate change, is, it's just the Green New Deal. It's basically, you know, why he keeps on saying there's two trillion dollars that's been invested. It's a big scam to get money. Mm. He's right. It is. Mm. The disconnect that the, the right wing can't get is that's true but it doesn't mean that there isn't a climate catastrophe yes so, exactly but again what's your climate catastrophe if you're saying that it's um anthropogenic that changes the very fundamentals of how you approach this problem and how you gain fear no no not quite because it, because it's too far gone so so basically what, what the important thing about the climate is 
is uh, you made another statement which I fundamentally disagree with in one of your previous things, and that's that the 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 climate system is resilient. It's not. It's exquisitely fragile. The what you're looking at now, you've got airport, you've got millions of years of of, of biology and um and uh what we know as catastrophic events in the fossil record that we can look at yeah life yeah, finds a I mean. way it's, it's it's unstable that's what i'm saying it's unstable it's not robust but, so but it, life it, finds it a way a catastrophic gyration yeah and that's that's fine that's like worrying about uh thunderstorms and rain um no not quite because because the, we've got through a number of bottlenecks right uh the the younger dryas and stuff about twelve thousand five hundred years ago that that was one of the last ones now about a hundred thousand humans uh you know just managed to squeak through in europe it was a very we each one of those things i mean we've been around for two hundred thousand years or maybe three hundred thousand years yeah but i mean as as fucking Australopithecus or something 4.3 million years. But the, the thing is that those were really, really lucky scrapes. So well, the thing you're missing now about anthropogenic uh, climate change is that, that we're doing uh, the changes faster than those. So there are catastrophic and, ex and extreme events, but there's a then younger than Then younger dryers, really. Like the, yeah, they, the, they can... the end of Dryas was an extreme event, but but not many people um, crept through, right? Uh, right, but people people still crept through. This is this is the, this is the point. So what's we have? Um, there's going to be a genetic memory, an epigenetic memory that's passed through. Okay, that that we know we can induce it in rats. Okay, that we we know that's, that there uh, are these. Okay, so so we, we, we squeaked through because we had an intact habitat. So so there were still, uh, particularly like the megafauna and stuff was taken out. I agree that probably not by, by humans, but the, the not entirely, but we must have contributed a bit, particularly with uh, scorched earth and stuff like that, which I think hunt, hunter-gatherers were doing. But the thing is that we had megafauna. We had an intact habitat, human habitat. What we've done now with the, the, particularly with the lack of diversity is that we can't squeak through now because there's not enough of our habitat left after civilization collapses. So uh, the, the problem uh, is that too fast. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like you could, you know, if you look in the climate record, you can see, oh, people say, well, we've had these CO2 concentrations. We've had, we haven't never in human history and in the Holocene uh, in the last 200,000 years, we've never had these temperatures. But we've had the CO2 concentrations. They don't mix completely. They're not correlation, uh, perfect correlation. But the, the science is reasonably well understood on, on that score. But the the thing is that when we went into those things previously as hunter-gatherers, they were slower. This is too abrupt, and it's ta it's taking down the food web so that there's nothing for survivors to support. You see, I, right, I went so, through a long so, I mean, uh, uh, so you just got to go back to Younger Dryas, right? You can look at the pulse water 1A, B, 1A, C, or 1A, 1A, B, okay? And you, that's days. Right, and you can you can see the the scars of it across North America, where the where the where the water, you know, it's completely the scab lands, all that type of all that type of stuff. Okay, that's all that's there. We can see, and we can see that there's a causal element towards um, a very very drastic change in the environment at a time when the population density was, I would argue, way way lower. Okay, and like I say, I don't know how, you know, if the sea levels were down 400 feet back then, how much got submerged. So we don't, we're not seeing how much human civilization there was. I don't know. Um, I'm the, the 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 very premise that we would take um, anthropogenic climate change and do anything other than um, what's been what's been instructed up from us from the very beginning, which is make life make life and keep making it and um and, and with that life there's a degree of conservatism that you need to maintain to make sure that the uh, the the social weaknesses that we're seeing right now 
don't crack and uh, undermine the um, the systems that we have, right? So th this is this is what we've got in the universities that the the environmental scientists are overrun with ideologues. Okay, that, that's 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 and it's been a very deliberate trajectory when yes, you look at it. Sorry to interrupt, Ken, but that's exactly what you were pointing at. Our attitude doesn't depend whether it's anthropogenic or is it natural. We want to be in a situation of facts and mm. where we are now, whether it's anthropogenic or not, doesn't matter a bit because we are not in the same situation as hunter-gatherers, as you were saying, that had a uh, soil that was able to sustain wildlife, uh, food that you were able to pick. We have complete, in Europe, America and a lot of the world, completely devoted land to, to intensive agriculture. If people, if there's a collapse of civilization uh, and the urbanized people run to the country to be able to find any food. The, in, 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 in previous catastrophes, well, a lot died, some managed in little gangs to get around, they found their fruit, they found some animals to kill somewhere. They just, but now when we faced, whether it's anthropogenic or not, we faced with this situation. Mm, you and, know, that, that's where we are. So the, the, the answer to that is get as many, you need skin in the game. You gotta have skin in the game to get through. And you wanna make sure that your your genes are the ones that, that do get through. And the, the problem with the anthropogenic side of the argument is, is that they've so subverted the, um, it's a Western problem, okay? It's not a, it's not a problem in, in Africa, okay? Look, they're coming en masse from sub-Saharan Africa and swamping the southern borders of Europe, such that the, um, the, the, the genetic diversity of Europe is, is at peril. Okay, we, we don't Why lack. Why are they people. coming? They're coming because of a climate crisis in Africa. <laughs> they're coming because of the bloody benefits well, that they get. I know. That's I, I know. But listen, look at look at what's going on in Kenya, where the land is bought by by the Chinese. Look at the drying of Ethiopia, the drying of Sudan, the wars. You know, it's much more complex than just coming to. You know, yeah, like and I'm, I'm I'm not buying I'm not buying Bob Geldof's uh, idea of this. Um, this idea that Ethiopia is always in this famine. We uh, we we no, engaged in a in a um, uh, essentially inf infantilizing them, bringing them corn and and so that they exceeded the carrying capacity of their lands. Right. This is these are these are not um, hard things to pick apart when you start when you step outside of the uh, the the green narrative and um, it's it, you've reached the point. In, in this dialogue, the the, the 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 clips come off, the safeties come off the grenade. Okay, it's 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 in the air right now, and you've got to you've got to run for cover. Uh, and the game theory approach says that SARS-CoV-2, even if it was an accident, even even right, and let's give them that that it it, it was an accident. The best of intentions that they were trying to prevent a pandemic. Okay instantiated this next pandemic but this pandemic somehow has the, the 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 holy grail embedded in it which is this slow burn prion process going on that then that then can convince people holy holy shit now we need now we need even more advanced medicines to to combat this prion thing because they it, the, the, those sneaky Chinese, etc. They they did it, etc. No one's everyone's backing off this like crazy because everyone's involved in its creation. No one's got clean hands right now. Um, what I would what I would put my trust in right now is um, we need we need a core group that okay we vaccinate half and we see if that's a better strategy and the other half we have to say look you can't get it because we don't know what it is that we're dealing with right now. Right, and that's and 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 that approach is the it's it's the sensible one as well as well as going with a a war footing with respect to the in uh, your your economies. The shutdown was a disaster, uh, in my opinion. Um, everything that's being done right now just it just almost looks like deliberate self sabotage, from my perspective. Yeah, agree. The I think that the it, there should be a variety of responses. 
is this uh, this the idea that we have one unified response is a big big mistake we shouldn't be putting all our eggs in one basket mm. so <clears throat> i think uh that's that's a very dangerous thing about all this suppression and censorship and stuff is mm. is like you say, they should be vaccinating uh, certain populations. They should be putting people in quarantine bubbles and having, uh, you know, green zones and, you know, corridors and stuff where people can circulate. But you want a variety of, of approaches because yeah. this, this is really uncertain. People don't really know what how this is going to evolve. So the worst thing you can do is centralize everything in some dictator's hands and, you know, in, in like the United Nations and who. So th this is this is the whole uh, thing behind my project and the, and the ARG is that our biggest threat of all is the centralized authoritarian response. And this and so I agree on. Get rid of the biggest threat if we're going into a crisis and collapse. And I'm telling you, we are. I'm living it. Hey, I'm yeah, a sailor okay. at sea, and we're in trouble in terms of the weather. Hmm. Uh, it's frightening at sea. I, I mean. I, it's all academic for people. I get a little bit emotional about the, the climate because uh, I, I'm a liveaboard sailor and in the sailing community, we're seeing the weather change and it, it's fucking alarming. I mean, the, it's, it's happening a lot faster than people realize and it's not academic for us sailors. It's, but yeah. it's, it, it's not a, some bullshit that you read about solar forcing and, and uh, I risk my life at least twice a year in these storms and the weather's... Uh, it's it's taking a turn that's it's a it's a a subject that continually uh, is discussed over beers about the liveaboard community and people are scared. It's uh, uh, people who live in uh, indoors. I mean, uh, outside of nature, you're living about as close as nature as you can get as a liveaboard mm -hmm. sailor, and the the it's the weather's changing and it's the reasons are known. Everybody knows it's. Uh, uh, and the reason why it's changing are known. Um, but mm. we have clearly destabilized. Uh, I mean, I have no doubt it's anthropogenic, but we've clearly uh, destabilized um, the, the climate system. So it's not a question of these smooth graphs and that there's abrupt climate change. And I mean, it's, a it's a payoff system. This is, this, is the, this is what I try to hammer home with um, People need to understand the complex net network complexity, right? Which is it, it's a yeah, key principle in, in in neuroscience that um, you can be looking at um, extended networks, and when you're trying to sort of pin down causality, and look, I I spent twenty plus years of my life just to capture this one image of the brain pushing out something that approximating causal, but it was a very abnormal behavior. It was taking this system, highly complex system, and artificially pushing it to one end okay but you could i got that snapshot of that causality but the um the ability to sort of there's a that there was a jitter even though we knew that there was this artificial signal in the noise that would be very difficult to to pin down precisely and there would be bits that would be missed and there's, there's there were so many factors that are laid on top of that that um it it's virtually an impenetrable um system to to fully you know, it's the same with the the ecology argument okay um what we do know is is that when the change happens just one small part of the network needs to initiate the change and boom it's it's it then cascades globally through the, through a system okay yeah, but so, so that's very well understood so that so that the, that tipping point so if you take the network the neural network. It's really a scale-free network. It has uh, Pareto distribution. You know, it's basically, mm. you know what that is, right? Basically, it's 80% of the, or 20% of the nodes will have 80% of the connections. It's a very mm. common thing from the reason for normal distribution and why it's so prevalent in natural systems. The ecosystem is, is like that too. The food webs are those scale-free networks. Now, they know very well, and uh, this is one of my areas of expertise that I've done a lot of modeling in this, and the, there's a tipping point at, strangely, 50%. So if, if you have 20% of the nodes controlling 80% of the effects or the network or something like that, uh, if you, 
you would only have to take out those 20% of nodes. And then because it's scale free, you can take out 20% of the 20% if you can identify them. There's, uh, you have data overload quickly in something complex as a neural net or an ecology. But in essence, in principle, it's mathematically provable that you can take 20% of the 20% of the 20%. And as long as you're getting the right preferential nodes, you could selectively take them out and take out very few uh, the nodes. This is very important mm. in terms of revolution and activism mm. and stuff. I'm trying mm. to get people to rebel in terms of social networks. But hang on. So the, so, uh, the, the thing is, if you just scattergun, if you just shot the nodes at random, then uh, without being selective, then the the system is quite a robust. It it's uh, it tips at fifty percent. So uh, that in terms of things like ecology, one of the big mistakes that uh, the public is making, and you know, is reinforced by these environmental sites like Mongo Bay and the Guardian and stuff, is they they show you these uh, species going extinct as a list. And everybody thinks, you know, oh, you go down the list and then you eventually get to humans. It's not. That list is talking about a scale-free network and each one of those species is a node. So there's a very good paper saying that basically that you get total extinction because of co-extinction co of the, the nodes. Uh, so, uh, and, and where it tips in the 50%. We're at 50% in so many of these ecosystems. If you take the ecosystem or the ecosystems, we at the tipping point. In fact, I think that it's more than reasonable to say we passed it in 2020. 2020 was a crucial year. And it's, it's because we've been taking out the nodes, bang, 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 at random, uh, we, we got to 50% in so many th uh, areas like say, the Amazon in terms of the marine life, um, in terms of the ecology in Africa and Asia. Uh, the land use in so many ways, we took out these scale-free networks and we tipped them them over. If if we didn't tip them over in 2020, it's just a matter of time in, in 2021, 2022. But I I think uh, we're in feedback in a feedback scenario. So the the thing that people don't understand very well, or they don't in, understand intuitively, is the same thing with the virus. They don't understand exponential growth. Mm. And, they don't, and the exponential growth comes from often a feedback loop. So they don't understand feedback and they don't understand exponential growth. So you see a lot of people with the virus, you saw this where they said, and a lot of people in Greece say, look, they don't believe it. A lot of people here in Greece do not believe that, the, in, that this virus exists. It's very common. And the reason is they say, well, you don't, I don't know anybody that's got it. Do you? And you say, well, no, you won't, because we're at the thin tail of the thing. But when it grows exponentially, it's suddenly, woof, it's going to get you. And that's exactly the same thing with the climate, is people are thinking linearly. And part of the misreporting of the IPCC is they're doing a deliberate snow job um, to actually say that it's more linear than it actually is. And that... and. The re it, it, it's not entirely malicious what they're doing. Their mandate is just a slow, uh, slow change down in terms of uh, environmental action, but uh, and to preserve the economy. So it's not an entirely malicious uh, in that in that way, but um, uh, it is dangerous because they. They're telling people that it's these smooth graphs, and they're not. They're basically about to break symmetry, and uh, there's there's going to be abrupt changes. So what we're seeing as liverboard sailors afloat is we've seen the abrupt change in the weather already. It's primarily due to the jet stream, and the, the weather is getting sticky. I'll, I'll give you an example of, say, the Maltemi here in Greece. The Maltemi is a wind, a very strong wind, and it's been feared from, from ancient times, um, from ancient Greek sailors, you know, from Jason, and then that uh, ran in fear of the Maltemi in, in, in the Aegean. And uh, the Malte if you look at the pilot guides, there's Ron Heichel's uh, Greek Waters pilot, which is everybody uses around here. He's got about a chapter of climate change. Um, mm. And in, he started doing the pilot guide since 1970, and he's visibly seeing how the these old timers have seen the weather change. Now, in the pilot guide, it says the Meltemi, you know, blows, you know, three times a year or so for about three days, sometimes five, and that's traditionally how it was described. 
it blows all the fucking time now. It's, 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 I mean, palm sweaty scary. That basically last season, it blew all fucking summer. It, it, it genuinely, the, this alarm is not being communicated to the public. It, it's just unbelievable. So the reason why the Maltemi blew uh, all summer, I mean, without fucking relentlessly, month after month after month, is basically the reason why it blew like that is because the jet stream is breaking down. And the jet stream is breaking down because there's not enough uh, temperature differential between the tropics and the, the Arctic. Well, it, it doesn't Arctic, break down. It becomes more... Um, it, it wavy. No, it's breaking yeah, it's, down. It's, 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 it's wavy. It's, 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 it's a more chaotic uh, imprint onto the... Yes, uh, yes but it's, have it's, not, it's not that it's not there. And the, 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 no, no, the it, idea... It, it, will, it, it will break. No, it, it's going to not be there. So it's getting wavy. But the the it has broken. In, in fact, it actually went... Uh, further south than the equator, which a lot of climate scientists says is not possible. Beckwith, there's a climate scientist called Beckwith, um, and he's got a YouTube channel. But he said that the the in this one instance, that the the jet stream broke up enough to to go past uh, the equator, and then there was uproar because there's you know other climate said, scientists said it's not possible, and it's a, and now the general agreement is yeah he was right. That it did. So it, it has, I mean, the very, very scary images of the jet stream breaking up. But, yeah, but the, the extreme it, weather we're trying bringing to, now I, is I would, one of the forms of, of it going wavy. So, what's the, the causal aspect here? Um, so, you can, there's a lot more to do with um, electromagnetic potential than there is to do with thermal input. Okay. And we, we are not even. Uh, an inch towards understanding the electromagnetic interactions of the of all the layers of the atmosphere, its interaction with um, local space, its um, <laughs> its interaction with the sun, right? We we're uh, we've only just sent a probe, the uh, I think it's called Walker probe actually, into into the uh, towards the sun where we're beginning to get an idea of the 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 structure of the real structure of the uh the plasma ropes that come off the sun and how they interact with with the earth okay and we we know we can look and we can see like so the northern lights we know that there are things called birkeland currents that connect the sun and the earth and we're in these we're in this global circuit okay we don't understand that circuit enough to be trying to push our idea of um, greenhouse gases onto um, this very, very complex uh, yeah, the plasma electro electrodynamic system. Okay. And like I say, it, it, we've only understood in the last few years that lightning literally comes from space. It's not, it's not yeah, something yeah. that's but I agree with you on all this. The, the electromagnetic aspects of space have been, you know, woefully um, under uh, underreported or under researched and basically underappreciated. Is is you know the huge uh, electromagnetic effects going on in space on the mm -hmm. upper atmosphere? I agree. It's uh, the the uh, I won't go into it. But there's 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 interesting things that are basically in the ionosphere. The there is a waveguide where there's a lot of electromagnetic uh, activity being circulated around the world and that mm. was only recently discovered it's a waveguide pretty much like your microwave oven mm. uh, and so but uh yeah you, you you i uh, absolutely agree with you a thousand percent but here's the the thing that i'm still feeling you're not you're not getting is it doesn't matter if i the fact is that it's whether it's natural or not. Uh, it's the, changing. The it's changed. changing. We get it. We get it. Everyone, yeah. everyone, yeah. everyone gets that it's changing. Um, the, it doesn't, the, no, it doesn't matter whether it's anthropogenic or not. I, I, I agree. The problem that we're dealing with right now is um, those that those that are convinced it's you living on your boat, Hugh, because you're putting out uh, marine. Uh, you're putting out marine oil into the harbour. 
right? I'm, uh, I'm not hang on, I have to, <laughs> My carbon credentials are fucking immaculate. I, I yeah. use about, I, I use, I, I mean, literally, I use about a, a kilogram of natural gas every every two months. I, I live, yeah, Disgusting. basically, I live off solar. I basically, the water I do is made with a water maker. Is basically when people start talking about wind turbines and solar, is like they can fuck right off because I live mm. on it. And I'm telling you, there's no such thing as energy transition. Solar, mm. I live, you're talking to a guy who lives off solar panels for so much so that my drinking water comes from a desalinator from, from solar panels. I had a wind turbine, I took it off my boat and chucked it away because it's fucking useless. I'm mm. telling you that basically. Wind turbines and solar panels stop that shit. It's bullshit. Yeah. It's horseshit. Nobody is going to be well, looking at panels. But I, I, I would say this: um, diversify your energy supplies. Right? There's not that. That's a that's a sensible argument to have. Don't be don't be held to ransom by uh, Saudi uh, oil families. Okay. Um, I'm I'm for fracking. I'm for I'm for getting energy anywhere and everywhere we can. OK, and um, if they can, and, you know, short of making uh, fusion devices, if there's some way to um, leverage your garden soil to get out that kilogram of natural gas um, so I can sell it to you, you, I'm all for that. <laughs> I, 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 here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem is that that if we've destabilized the, the Earth system and the climate, um, it's a population bottleneck that, like you say, you probably want to have kids and trying to make sure that your genes <laughs> squeak through. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. If I, but I mean, I think I'm convinced that the greenhouse gas concentrations, are, uh, you know, imply that it's anthropogenic. So I'm sold on the idea it's anthropogenic. If if you carry on putting CO2 up in the atmosphere, which is what you're doing if you burn fossil fuels, is uh, that you, gra you know, drastically decrease the number of people that can make it through that population bottleneck. So if you want your kids to survive the bottleneck, uh, you want to stop that carbon and you want to stop burning fossil fuels. You don't want us to do it with by you know with solar panels and all this fucking fiction, but uh, you know we need rise rapidly. Our only hope is to step on the, the brakes of industrialization. So it's basically what what COVID has shown is is a number of of proving things that were theoretically um, doubtful. One of them is the global dimming and the aerosol masking effect It's basically getting some data on that now. But the, the other thing is that the 2008 and now this pandemic has showed that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between greenhouse gas emissions and the GDP. There was about a 7% decrease in the GDP in uh, global GDP in 2008 after the financial crisis. And there was a corresponding 8%. Um, uh, uh, basically, it's a one-for-one uh, percentage correlation between industrial slowdown and greenhouse gas emissions. So, so it, what that implies is we have to take greenhouse gas emissions to zero. I mean, we're talking emissions to zero. There's no such thing as net emissions. That's a complete con game. Um, and, but we have to, to get to zero emissions. We need zero industrial output. And that's no, I, 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 I don't. I'm not buying that though, because there is a, there is a um, there is a carbon cycle. We're carbon. We're like I say. We live in very um, look. The fact you're on a boat that's probably fiberglass and um, all sorts of uh, man-made materials is testament to you being able to survive in uh, environments that were unthinkable um, even a, a few generations ago. Okay, we and we're we're at levels of population right now. Yes, we could we we could see a very big dieback. Way way bigger than um, people are expecting. That's part that's part of the game theory that you have to take on on board right now. And it, the pressures can come from multiple um, multiple directions. So, say for example, just step back from something that's kind of nebulous because we we can't. It, it, it's difficult to grasp the causal element in it, which is you know. The, so it can go back and forth all the time. This climate debate. It's, I've been watching it my whole life. I was I was petrified as a child that we were going to be under a mile of ice. Okay, 
Um, but the what was very clear was that programming was ongoing at that time that frightened children. And um, I would say we've we can learn a lot from this past year. Okay, the impacts on um, the atmosphere are not as irreversible as the uh, the doomsayers make out with respect to um, the particulate matter. It all cleared. It all cleared and went away within weeks of China basically shutting down and China's back up and <laughs> building more power stations. They don't they don't care and they they will push through and they will they're not going to deindustrialize. OK, and if they manage to maintain a vestige of in industry and we don't, we've gone back to agrarian um, lifestyles and we've we've you're just going to have Mongol hordes coming across the Eurasian plate again to come and come and pillage. And um, I want my belt fed machine gun and uh, I want a extended family all with belt fed machine guns to keep them at bay. Right. That's how I think, because it's nature. You, you're right. So, so you, but you're missing a few pieces. One of the pieces you're missing is that that you're not unique in in this assessment. If you yeah. uh, if you ask about the, you got to ask yourself, who the power brokers? What what do they think? Is is have they figured this out, or is it just you? And I'm telling you now that I know for a fact, as as someone who's seen behind the curtain, that they figured this out long before anybody else. There's a, a ongoing frustration with climate activists that says, you know, why, you know, you know, Extinction Rebellion is they doing all this activism, trying to wake up politicians as why is there so much lethargy? Why is there so much inertia? Why do why are these politicians being Don't so and, stuff? and I'll tell you the answer is the, the, the answer that they're not getting is these guys figured out long ago, decades ago, that we're fucked. So they they trapped and they're doing panic management. They just moving slow enough to basically accede to the public, um, the, the published co uh, consequences of how close we are to collapse. But it, short of actually doing panic management, they're going to do as little as possible because they've got, I don't know this for a fact because I've, I've had never seen a document in that I, I can only infer from little scraps that I've seen. And so I don't know what it's called or something, but as far as I can tell, I, I just call it the Millerways Doctrine. I wrote a book about it and just I just named it that because I, I, I haven't got any insight into what it really is. But from what I can piece together is they have a doctrine that basically says we're trapped, we're fucked, and we're going to go out on kind of a high. <laughs> basically, we, we, we're we going to try and manage it all the way. And then inside that, there are various factions on how to, how mm -hmm. to cope with it. But the dialogue inside places like the Pentagon is fucking nuts. I mean, I'm telling you, psychotic nuts. And so the, the kind of faction <laughs> in that you're talking about the inside places like the Pentagon is is the guys who think like you do, who think like, well, you know, it's it's kind of it's almost like um, you know, Doctor Strange love and uh, you know, Kubrick's uh, Doctor Strange. It's almost like the war room scene in, in there. It's as cunningly accurate as the, <laughs> some of those guys think we're gonna survive because we got a, a mine shaft gap and we're gonna go in <laughs> mine. So there's the the survivalist uh, kind of group. There's there's one scary group that uh, where Star Wars and all this shit came from, and that's basically. I, I mean, these guys are batshit crazy, uh, but they they think that we're all an alien experiment, mm -hmm. and they uh, you see these releases from you know there was the F 17s in San Diego and stuff. They keep on releasing all this UFO stuff. They used to release UFO stuff like Area Fifty One and stuff as a cover for secret projects and skunk work projects. But what, mm -hmm. what, from what I can tell, these latest ones have come out of these guys that are genuine, genuinely preparing for an alien invasion. Now, even within that faction, I've heard that the guys that are saying that um, we, we're a kind of alien experiment, and I riffed off that in my videos, actually. <laughs> I, have, I, put, I put in things that are basically trolling the guys, if anyone of those guys said. Um, I asked my contact guy, 
ex uh, alphabet soup guy and i said well where where would these guys come from he says from the pleiades mm -hmm. and so i put in a lot of references and stuff into my alternate reality game based on players but the, that faction says we can't we we're not in trouble because because we're an alien experiment they will intervene if we fuck it up too badly so they think we can go and do you know release as much co2 and go you know they they think that there's enough monitoring going on by extraterrestrials that you know if if trump hit the big red button or something they, they would stay his hand oh, <laughs> you know? oh Hugh, so what it, you're it, saying they're almost, mystical. they're almost mystical yeah Oh, uh, what you're saying reminds me of a movie I saw. Did you ever see that remake of The Day the World Stood Still? <laughs> it's like, yeah, the aliens will come, see the mess we made of the planet, release uh, um, nanomachines and fucking kill us all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, well, there's that group too. Actually, Hawkins thought that. Haw Hawkins thought basically, he said like, yeah, the aliens, so you don't want to actually make contact with aliens because, uh, you know, if they're anything like us, they're, they're going to oh, use us. Oh, well, in the, in, the, in the remake of the movie, the alien came to try and convince humanity to stop destroying the planet. And um, when he got uh, accosted by the uh, like security, uh, security leaders of the United States, they gave him a bad impression. So he activated the nanomachines and they started killing everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But anyway, anyway, I just paint this picture to tell you that we're, we're in serious trouble yeah. because these guys are barking, barking mad. The, the guys in the wheelhouse of this Titanic are fucking barking mad. So, but I'm telling you that the, the, the most of them, the consensus of the guys that are actually, you know, pulling all the strings, the guys behind the curtain, they... I'll, I'll tell you for a fact, they're tracking to a seven degree by the end of the century. Um, they, no one really knows Earth sensitivity, so they don't, don't know where it stops. They, there are a few scenarios that we might be tracking for, and those are like Venus Earth uh, scenarios where the Earth gets sterilized like Venus um, because uh, of runaway heating. But, but in general, the, the Department of Transport, for a fact, um, is estimating seven degrees by the end of the century. Seven degrees we don't we scrape through. I don't, I don't think anybody credibly thinks there are humans left. Um, I, 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 I'm, just, I, I'm not buying those projections right now because, uh, look, it's like me doing... No, I, no, I, I, I'm not the, trying the, to convince the, you of those projections. <laughs> I'm just trying to convince you that of the mindset of the guys that are actually behind the curtain. <laughs> So, so yeah. what, what I'm trying to say is those guys have uh, collapse built in. So if you, if you, if you, any conspiracy theory in that you, you have to say that these guys are in the know, they know a hell of a lot more than us and they have a lot better systems for aggregating data. So uh, collecting and aggregating is. Yeah, but you've, you've still got to interpret a holistic the data. view and I'm telling you they're tracking towards collapse. Yeah. You know? So I can, I can. <laughs> I can look at, the, let's say I, I shoot off from orbit and I look down on uh, life on this planet and I would say, well, you know, everything sort of, um, it reaches a carrying capacity, then it levels out. These are, these are sort of basic principles that we see with uh, biology, whether it's sort of bacteria or lions uh, on the savannah. Um, can you make, could you make the argument that humans have exceeded some sort of carrying capacity? Yes, if we would, reliant on flint tools and uh, all this all that type of stuff are uh, is the is the influence of um mutually assured destruction type thinking prevalent in institutes like the pentagon and the the, the defense yes of course they always that's part of their game theory and that's why i think game theory um paradigms have run their course it, it's it's just always into a dead end loop all the time, especially when you don't have the full. Um, or, or it's not even that you have the full data. It's that you skew your analysis in a particular way, right? So we're we're constantly we're constantly having to adjust. That's the power of the scientific method that we'll get through. And I I would put forward the premise that yes, it's changing. I think the um, just this, like I say, Milankovitch cycles, global uh, solar minimum, etc. And I've seen people freaking out about this Maunder minimum, 
right? And where do I hear that from? Well, you hear it from places like America where the, the countries are still young and um, juvenile. You don't hear the Aborigines worrying about solar minimums, right? If you're, if you're the, if you are part of the, I forget what the Finnish um, reindeer, herders I forgot whether I was going to use them as an example but the sun. yes that's 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 them um the <laughs> if you've got a culture that's embedded and survived generations and generations these type of existential worries are not there right um I I could I could make a tilt towards saying that um or, or let me ask you a question here why are you on a boat it's my prepping strategy Right, your, pre your prepping strategy, but what if your prepping strategy was wrong based on a uh, faulty interpretation of the data? And what you've done is you've put yourself into an existential, um, or you've moved across the edge of the existential risk factors because you've shrunk your world by thinking that the boat was the best, uh, the best strategy. Right. And I, if, no, no, it's not a bunker strategy. So I encourage people. Not no, to no, I didn't say bunker. bunker. I said best, not not bunker. Best. No, no, no. But I mean, you're, you're saying that I'm doing no, I'm, I'm not on a boat because it's a bunker mentality. I, I, I strenuously tell people don't prep with a bunker mentality. It's I'm not doing it as a bunker mentality. The, um, I'm not on a boat because uh, that's the way I want to live. It's basically the because it's my preferred way of dying. So, so could I could I could I could I suggest that it was perhaps there was a fear of rising sea level? And, no, no, uh, no. So the rising sea level stuff is bullshit. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not worried about I mean, rising, rising sea, level. sea level, but it's not it's not a it's not an issue. It's it's a mm. nonsense. Yeah. But di did you did you take into account um, wobbly jet streams when yeah. you uh, yeah. and yeah. Yeah, I, I, I miscalculated a little bit. In the, you see, what I figured the reason why I'm on a boat is because I arrived in Los Angeles in 1994, uh, just after the Rodney King riots, and so uh, basically everybody was seriously rattled. And I, I just missed the Rodney King riot by about a week, but everybody told me what this prepping strategy was for a little mm. uh, kind of a Mad Maxi scene. And mm. um, I had some friends who had a boat, and I sailed with them in Los Angeles. Uh, they sailed out of Los Angeles Harbor, and I asked them what they had to do. They had to go across town from Santa Monica through all these rioters, and they were seriously worried for their life. And they live in, in Long Beach, and so they had all these guys screaming past their house, basically burning shit and <laughs> breaking. And mm. So they were really worried for them. And they thought, what the fuck do we do? Uh, so they say well let's get down to our boat and we'll just head head out to sea so that's mm -hmm. what they did they got in their boat they headed out and they realized about 500 meters off the coast of los angeles they realized well no one can get us here what the fuck do we do so they mm -hmm. just basically uh, lay a hole and thought well now we're just watching it like television they're watching all the smoke going up <laughs> from their boat 500 meters offshore and they thought well, this is fucking interesting. What do we do now? Well, we've got a bottle of champagne. Let's crack that. So, they, so the, the two of them sat with glasses of champagne watching Los Angeles go up. And I went like, mental note to you, buy a boat. That's a good fucking strategy. But it's... You want to be mobile. You want to be able to move because there's uncertainty. You want to be able to change your situation. So it's, it's worked out uh kind of good and kind of bad is one of the things that la uh, landlubbers don't realize is although the weather gets uh more severe and it's getting really bad now uh at sea the uh you can avoid the weather i mean it's a skill and so you can outrun hurricanes and you know there's a lot of discussion on techniques for weathering and stuff but you can survive a lot of weather on a boat. I, I got caught out now with the Medicaid. The Medicaid in 2018 was the first hurricane in the in the Med. And I thought, okay, well, this is going to be a trend now. I'm expecting more. The reason I'm in the Ionian now is because of I don't want to get into Medicaid again. <laughs> there are a lot of friends who lost boats and stuff. Um, so, the yeah, so so anyway, the... the um, 
the, the Medicaid caught me out because it caught me in Crete and there was nowhere to run for. So I spent a nasty few days with uh, the eye of that hurricane coming right for me in Heraklion and prepping for, for the hurricane. I couldn't run left or right because it came down Altamiali, circled round, um, gathering heat, and then was forecast. I spent three days with it forecast with the eye coming over Heraklion and um, uh, 135 knot winds. It was, I was shitting myself. And uh, it, it passed north and went to Kalamata. And the, my friends in Kalamata, you should hear their stories about it. But, but I survived. It was, I, uh, you know, hurricane proofed the boat with other sailors and that. The sailing community is not isolated. It's one of the reasons I'm also here is because of the mutualism. A lot of people have float that are anarchists and have seen uh, and, and doomers. And they've seen which way this is heading, and they're doing the same thing as me. So there's a community, and basically the boat community. I, I hurricane, you know, basically got into Hurricane Hole and, and survived it with with them. It's a very good way to uh, to prep um, because you you have these extensive networks. You're not alone. Um, and that's what I encourage people to do. People that go into bunkers are making a big mistake. That the prepping mentality in the states is you arm yourself and you go into a bunker. I'll tell you, that's the worst fucking idea you've ever had. Uh, from South Africa, the people that did that, um, particularly arming yourself, uh, the statistics were that 60% of people <clears throat> were killed with their own weapons, mainly from suicide. So I, I'm telling you, if you're one of those guys who think you're gonna get tin food and arms and you're gonna prep for Mad Max scenario, out in, you know, head up to Montana, I'm telling you, don't fucking do it. You, the kind of decisions you're gonna have to make is like, you know, which, uh, the order that you shoot your kids in. You, you go, what happened in South Africa was there was uh, murder suicides of families and uh, it's still endemic in, in the farmers and the farming community. But if, if you wanna go out in this apocalypse and in that kind of way, of, you know, just think about it, that, that night where you have to take out your weapon and shoot your family and then like, think about it, which one do you shoot first? But, you know, that, that, do you drug them? Do you drug them before you shoot them? How are you gonna play out this? But anyway, if your plan is to go in a bunker, you better make sure your wife and kids are on up with this plan and know where it ends up. But I'm telling you, you you're heading for a fucking nightmare. Don't do it. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd just add this caveat that probably you need all sorts, right? You need some on boats, you need some in bunkers, you need some, and you need that you need that kind of dispersal um, globally right now. And so, that can yeah, say, you know, yeah, yeah. But you need to think locally and you need to think mutually. Yeah. You need to mm. think group. You need to think support. You, you don't think individual. That's That's the main thing to take out of what? Hugh was saying, I think for me is the the, the mutual support, mm. the mutual exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's what I've been trying to tell people right now. Um where everyone, because of the systems that we've built, the mutualism is not the person physically next door to you right now. Um and right now that person could be it's literally the odds are that that person is an ideologue that would um cancel you in a microsecond. Um, because they feel it's for the greater good. Um, because you, you see it played out uh, on the digital space all, all the time right now. And you want to, and so the idea is to network, um, you know, take a key from neuroscience. And even if you have to send projections, you know, that uh, you, know, you take the, the size of a neuron cell body and you look at its axon length, you know, the scale is, is enormous compared in, in terms of where it's trying to reach, et cetera. In, in fiber bundles, but um, we can connect through these fiber bundles and we can look at, um, we can aggregate data better uh, or, or sort of group source the, or, or yeah, is it, yeah, we're, we're not sourcing the data, but we're, we're aggregating and analyzing as well. So everyone is taking a bit of the picture that they're seeing and saying, okay, this is this is what I'm seeing in my corner of the world. So someone someone put in my chat a little while ago, it's sort of shot by, but it, it caught at the corner of my eye, was that they've been told that they're gonna die from um, runaway, some form of runaway uh, climate um, nonsense from 
since they were a child and that's what i remember but instead what's happened is is that they've had their culture subverted by um some you know third world um immigration and that's an existential risk as well and that's something that doesn't uh doesn't get spoken about because um well again i would point to the united states sort of taking the lead on this is that um it's a young country that's struggling with um well what is what's a country what's a what's a people's what a and uh, as a it's a consensus country and consensus requires some degree of advanced um civilization you know we got um America was uniform, very uniform in its makeup until very, very recently, and had a lot of space. Still has a lot of space, but they've just they've weaponized the information aggregation there as well, such that you you, you can't um, you don't get sense from people. You just speak to ideologues all the time, and I, I'm I'm like this. Oh, that's not a person that you're speaking to. Are you uh, waving at me here? <laughs> no, no, somebody outside. So, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, but so I don't see that wokeism as an ideology uh, is has much legs. I, I mean, it's it's privileged, and I think that the middle class is about to lose its privilege. So it's it's not going to last much longer than um, you know, kind of affluence. In the bourgeoisie, <laughs> so uh, it, basically, it's it's probably had its day as soon as the food prices start going up, and they're already going up. But uh, basically, oh, wow. they'll, they'll get over it quickly in a famine. They're basically, there are no there are no wokists in a foxhole, <laughs> you might say. Right, and but the thing is, um, they they can still have a sting in the tail, right? And so, um, you know, who. The, the people behind uh, the, the, the group-driven ideologies, the whether so, let's take a, an example that everyone can agree on, which is the Bolsheviks in um, Soviet in, for the Soviet Revolution, right? That's something that people can agree on. Oh, that that turned into something pretty bloody horrible, and that was that was an existential threat to many many. Uh, people and it was all encompassing but it wound down eventually and it, but it, it was well <laughs> it depends where where you want to take your measurement of the swing of the pendulum but the the sort of internal collapse because of the contradictions in face of the um the libertarian approaches of the west that that was superior at the time we could we outcompeted them in the in the material domain and in the ethics. I guess I guess we we still had this idea of um, sovereignty and um, it hadn't been subverted to the point that wokeism has done uh, right now. Um, but we I don't I, I don't know if um, you know something like Duganism is gonna kick in. And that's that they've they've got a uh, bloodlust revenge for what happened to them, right? And what and the the pain that they went through that that side of the equation. And like I say, this comes back all to what's co what's coming down the path with respect to Belt and Road Initiative, how they're going to pivot the world, how they how they're going to manage populations, and we are global cattle to them right now. We're a resource to be used and abused. And if you're, um, if if I'm trying to teach anything right now, it's um, uh, how to analyze the the scientific data such that um, you're you're trying to see both sides all, all the time, rather than running. It would be easy to run away with, oh, it's just eco health, it's just China. But that's the narratives that you're seeing right now. Hoover Institute just had. Um, he was on Joe Rogan. I keep Metzl, Jamie Metzl, who, um, you know, but he's got links to World Economic Forum. And, and you're seeing, to me, I'm like, okay, I'm seeing a narrative being made. And Joe Rogan sitting there as a, a as part of it just says to me, oh, this is, this is again, information psyops that we need to be, uh, we need to be careful of that we don't get swept up in. 
right but, now. But it's so it's so multifaceted. I mean, look at the Rockefeller Institute and that. They're just they're just fucking armies of these fucking organizations mm -hmm. that really have this uh, one world agenda. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm in a total agreement with you that, uh, that I don't agree with Steven Pinker much, but one thing I do agree with him on is that our real danger in collapse is ideologues. It's like mm -hmm. the Bolsheviks and that. Th those bastards, uh, the communists and Gramsci's long march the institutions and that, the, it's the guys that want to force an ideology and then that's where wokeism comes in. Is the last thing we fucking need is some social warrior agenda while this collapse. Mm -hmm. It's like, dudes, we've got enough fucking problems. Just, just, well, keep just look at the, the US way. in the summer. That's, the, the, that's, what, that's what it looks like. And um, I, I'm not sure if that's finished yet. Uh, what we, what you saw in? No, the no, it's not. It's it's mm. it's just warm enough. But mm. but here's here's what I I want to ask you is is okay. So so you're taking on a role that I'm doing, and that's uh, you know kind of a shamanistic role. You're being a guru for a lot of these people. <laughs> yeah, don't do that with me. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, you'll get. No, rid no, of you, you've got to follow. I mean, I mean, how how big is your tribe now? Uh, I don't know, like probably, f I would say 500 to 1,000 people will watch me a day, depending on what I'm doing and who I'm talking to. But, so so that's, uh, that's, 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 that's substantial. So now, um, where are you going to take this now? Because uh, in your current format, I don't know that, uh, you know, it's not built for growth, right? No, but I d I'm not aiming for that. It's um, I think once you're th there's a point where once you reach some sort of growth, that becomes uh, inherently addictive. Um, you yeah. the the clout and the ego builder. You just see it all the time, and I've yeah. I've seen it in trying to reach out to people and just say right at the beginning, hey, there's something with SARS-CoV-2 that's uh, impacting the nervous system. This isn't the this isn't flu, right? And uh, that's played out and that's why there's a 500 to a thousand people watching me because they uh they listened to what i was saying on stefan molyneux uh, and by, uh, by the way kevin i wanted to thank you very much for leading people through reading articles in a right way and research in a right way paying attention to phrases to way things are put to the reference to the the way the study is conducted because I've been in the medical profession. I know how you can be easily misled uh, reading a study too fast uh, and how the public... I did it yesterday. I did yeah. it yesterday. Yeah. Right. But so, you, that, that is precious because it's education. Um, mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, too, too few people actually know how to read the scientific jargon. I actually didn't know how to read that shit until I went through a couple of years of college because I was in as a science major for a little bit. Mm. It takes a lifetime. It, it, it's still, I'm still doing it now, right? There, you know, there are even within my field, neuroscience. Sometimes I've got to be like, okay, I don't. I'm, these are things that I'm not it's outside my wheelhouse, so to speak, and I've got to stop and um, and and reappraise what it, what it is that I think that I know, even though I might know the the vernacular that they're using. Do I really know it to the level that I'm uh, comfortable with? And um, what I see right now is I see, we, you can see a very um, uh, self-reinforcing negative term within the sciences, within the virology community, because of them buying into this, this One Health doctrine. Because you know what? That's where the grant money was, right? And, and now you're seeing that play out uh, in real time. I would argue the same things happened with uh, the environmental uh, sciences as well and environmental sciences was were some of the first to get you know were, that were on the chopping block with respect to the march through the institutions it's very hard to um to get in to get wokeism into a uh, laser laboratory right something like geophysics though is a different matter when it's about trekking through rainforests and trying to um you know where, Choose your, choose your poison the, 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 the list is you know something something more sort of anthropological and then trying to bootstrap that onto 
um, cultures and institutions and saying you have to be like like this. And at, ev at every at every turn, I see an ideologue at, at, at everywhere. And um, if there's just one thing, you know, you summed it up nicely, Hugh. Which it's like I've been using it a lot since precautionary principle, right? You used that word last week. From what was it last? Week? It's just a week, right? <laughs> since we had spoke, um, so much happens in a week at the moment. But you said precautionary principle apply the precautionary principle in a chaotic environment because that's what that's what you're seeing now and there are people that feed off chaos or, or, or i do <laughs> <laughs> so uh <laughs> good time for me <laughs> i'm having a ball <laughs> but i try not to let people know that sometimes i just can't help myself but we so you you becoming a teacher and and I'm sure you'll become quite influential, but where's what's the end game? Where where do you wind up? I, I would I would just be saying this um, because they'll take me out. I can't look. The more I sit here and and point to things like prions and stuff like that from a precautionary principle, okay, either in the virus itself or within uh, if you want to go date Michelle Pfeiffer, okay. Um, they will they will use that right now to slam me into the ground depending on how it does or doesn't play out and they'll distort what it is that i'm saying so that i'll get made irrelevant at some point right so um it if if the worst elements of um weaponized prions emerge well i, I don't feel like taking a victory lap under such circumstances and um i had a heavy encounter with SARS from Korea um I might be on on the on the way out anyway so what I would do is I kind of see this as sort of you know if I, if something does happen um in in the short term that um I'm recording locally that my children can still get from that and the one lesson I would say is um this whole idea when I was growing up, don't you know, you don't want to have kids too early, go to university, do do this, do do that. What that did was splinter families and um, essentially made us weaker and more at the whim of uh, these high, these bigger structures that like uh, like populations moving around, following capital, all that type of thing. Whereas I would I would say, like I say, go local, go family. Go family, okay. You, you know that you know that that stuff was planned, right? You you'd be surprised how how basically intellectual and forebrained it was. Do you, do you know about Eddie Bernays and, and all? Oh yes, stuff? of course. <laughs> Grab your freedom sticks, ladies. Um, yeah, that might be one way for you to get out. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, Adam more, and Adam Red has been here too. Uh, I, I, I What's that? that? Adam Curtis, um, the last, especially the last series of, of uh, documentaries on the BBC that address the same kind of thing you're referring to there. Yeah, there, there's Uncle all Eddie. Yeah. yeah, there's like Eddie Bernays and then people like from the Trilateral Commission, which pretty much made the education system make Americans dumb. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But, uh, and, you know, beyond One Health, the, the CFR and these guys have their fingers deep inside the, the pie and they're controlling the, spr the strings of this marionette. It's, mm. it's absolutely relentless. I mean, it's, the, the forces arrayed against us are just unbelievable. I mean, the, the, I don't think people in the UK in particular get how fearsome and awesome the American military machine is. And there's no boundary between military uh, security and corporate. Uh, they just they just blur in America so that you know, <laughs> but, the, but you, they've, 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 they've gone down that there, there was um, the, the military was ordered. I think it was yesterday. I read it to defend um, LGBTQ and I'll add P uh, rights onto that. OK, that's your military done. <laughs> that's your military done. OK, um, China's just got to wait. Okay, they're not. They're not. But, they're, they're, like I say, they want to break. But, but, but here, here's a good example of why uh, wokeism hasn't got much future. So, so in general, what happens in pit to peacetime armies is they decay, 
and all sorts of this bullshit happens. And then you, know, you saw it actually during the Gulf War. You have all this feminism and equal rights for gender, and then you know it's like fine. But I'm mean, telling you, you don't want women in frontline trenches. Uh, mm -hmm. Anarchist in in, in like Catalonia will tell you they segregated them. It didn't fucking mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. You don't want women on a battlefield unless they're doing you know dressings and stuff. You you can it doesn't matter about gender equality. However, it's like really. Uh, battlefield isn't a place for gender equality, but peacetime armies forget all this stuff, and so they start, you know, because it's uh, they're on a meal ticket, and everybody in the military and security apparatus, they're just welfare queens, you know, living mm -hmm. with tax money, and so then they push and say, like, women are, you know, should be allowed to, you know, fly fighter jets, and they should be allowed to be, you know, grunts with uh, in, uh, in trenches and stuff, and then what happens is, like, the Jessica... Uh, no, what was her name? Uh, Je yeah, Jessica. Uh, I don't know. He mean he got captured by, th and then they yeah. sent in special forces. But <laughs> yeah, um, and, then, and then basically what happens immediately is they take you know some guy on the top says like get all the women out of the front lines. That is such mm. bad publicity for the war. That we, mm. <laughs> you know, if, they, if we don't bring them all home, then basically they take them out of those um, out of harm's way. Then basically it's a very bad propaganda coup. So it, you see how quickly it swings from like peacetime grand queen. Hey, you know, these guys have a free meal ticket. Women also need a free meal ticket. And they say like, yeah, okay, meal ticket ends. Now you have to go and get your fucking head blown off. And it's like, oh, no, we can't have women's head blown off. They'll get raped in the front line. And so, yeah, mm. welcome to the reality and take them out. So basically, what, mm. so traditionally, uh, militaries take about five years to go to complete horseshit without a battle. So Amer America, one of the reasons why they can keep going with Chomsky's perpetual war is, is to keep the military on its toes. You need these wars, uh, but but... In the meantime, this wokest agenda is like creeping through. So the LBGTQ mm. stuff, and then like yeah, they'll forget that instantly as soon as the bullets start flying. Yeah, we, we know this, but um, again, this is the precautionary principle. How many how many bodies are we frying up against that first wave before we oh, before yeah. we forget that, that? That's the expense. That's the expense. Is that the, basically all this is paid for in blood? So all this mm. nice. Stuff, I mean, like, Jesus, man, I, I got so many gay friends and stuff. It's, it's like, uh, yeah, I want the best for them. But because I want the best for them, I say, like, you know, we don't want to be doing this shit because it's paid for later in blood. It's mm. a, you know, There's an old expression in the military, like, sweat on the battlefield uh, saves uh, – su sweat on the training field saves blood on the battlefield. And, and what we're doing here is basically we, we are not doing the correct training. We're just going to pieces in terms of military strength and getting to, you know. <laughs> so al al uh, almost, almost like it looks like a deliberate sort of subversive plot to take a, take down uh, the preeminent superpower on the planet. Who, who I wonder who would want that. Right, and this is, this is, is where a, there are a number of strands to it. There are a number of strands, but uh, you know, a lot of it is just straight off short sightedness and greed. And so, you know, you, once you have a capitalist mindset, and then uh, so, so on the one hand, you have a strategy of like communism and the, the long march and creeping in through through the but on the other side, you just have you know, capitalist greed where it's like, hey, I want a free gravy chain on the taxpayer. So the libertarians and the communists actually have it both right. Mm, it's, it's, just, yeah. it's just part of the, the decay that creeps in in a peacetime army from, from both sides. Yeah, but and this is anyway. I, I, yeah, yeah, but, but, but I, I so, just, so, it's, it's such, a, such a crucial point that you, that you just said there, right? That um, this, th those ide ideologies are, are th that's the 20th century. Right? And those are collapsing. And when those things, when we know from history, when those things collapse and it's been accelerated um, massively within the last year, just as a societal level, this is, again, put the environmental aspect out of it. With, I would argue we have to look at it through a battlefield reference. Dude, you've been in the military. You, you understand about uh, NBC uh, training and what it is that you're supposed to, um, how you're supposed to sort of posture yourself right now and you disperse your forces you make sure that you've got uh protection on you make sure that they're not getting um 
uh you know so the contagion can't you've got fire breaks against contagion that that stops it getting and taking out your critical uh, forces we're not doing it in our civilian population we need fire breaks hmm. so so right here in greece we've got natural fire breaks because we're on islands and but they're not making quarantine zones or like green zones and free, you know free access basically we're not in these these bubbles like australia and new zealand at one stage could have, could have made a quarantine bubble and they could have gone on their lives pretty easily mm -hmm. but they they won't do that they, because we're running up against economics they're keeping mm -hmm. all the infrastructure so the ferries are going and the planes are still arriving on a fucking island without a hospital mm -hmm. Mm. So, so basically, it's it's like you cannot do that. You've got to basically disconnect. If we disconnect, mm. we're fine. Everybody goes to the bars. You can basically have deliveries of booze. We're food self-sufficient on these islands. The Greek government mm. is making a spectacular fuck up of a mm. perfect natural situation. One, I mean, I was expecting my uh, part of talking boat strategies. I was expecting the four horsemen. So they're basically plague is one of them now you mm. really want to be able to find a fucking island and basically mm. island hop as soon as it, all of us knew i'm not going to tell you about my community but if all of us knew that that you know as soon as fucking plague hits the whole fucking island we're up anchor and out of there mm. and uh, and fucking i i have I can't really say this, but I've had such a fucking ball during this pandemic. I basically uh, the previous lockdown I spent in this island that's uh, one of the gems of the world, mm. and I had it to myself with two other boats. And uh, it, it, it generally the police turned a blind eye because there were no cases on the island. It was completely cut off, and mm. uh, it just kind of carried on kind of thing with their own life in secret, basically. So it wasn't too of a but mm -hmm. uh, they could have done that on every single Greek island. They didn't do it because of the fucking economics. Because, mm -hmm. uh, and for a number of other esoteric things, is, is one of the things they're very scared of that I don't think they uh, comes across is they're very scared that they get the machine going again after this. Because, you know, people are working remotely from home. That breaks the boss-worker relationship. There, there are a lot of these, if, if this these kind of lockdowns go on there are a lot of systemic changes that just happen organically that people get mm. comfortable in a new way of life part of the thing is people are localizing people mm. uh you know that's what what lockdown does that that'll destroy it's making a mindset that destroys the global economy and the globalist agenda so mm. they they worried about that getting the machine up uh, again get it started again so a lot of the things you see a lot of the narrative is let's get back to normal stuff because it's worrying them that uh, there's more and more inertia building up to getting back to wage slavery on a global scale and mm. so the, the world system is falling apart um, and so there's this tension between the the governments that want to just get the economy going and, and, uh, and that's that's why i just argue people uh, i'm i'm trying to stress people take this chance this is the like nature has given you this chance to to decouple from these systems and yeah it'll be, it'll be tough right for a lot of a lot of people but um there's no if 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 you're doing something that's it based there's no reason for you being commuting uh to a day job and and engaging in that type of activity right um train should be for trips to the seaside right and um yeah, people, yeah. People, <laughs> pay, pe people who have um uh put in a uh or invested so heavily into the system that they've over leveraged themselves that they've become the rent seeker types um that we have to accept that well not that we have to accept but um it's better to let nature take its course and let and let those things wither away are you going to see are you going to see I, I would want to see the reintroduction of the industries that were taken away from um from communities in Europe, okay, like car manufacture, bring that back, bring it, make it more local. But there's no need for every car, every family to have three, four cars, right? Make better, better stuff more locally, and try to and and use this time right now to carve out a new a new niche, right? That's it's the evolutionary principle in action. 
so I've I've carved out my niche. The bargain I made with myself was I'd carve out my niche and then basically try and do activism and help others because I'm primarily an accelerationist. I I want the opposite to you. I want industrialism to end because it'll give more chance to people to squeeze squeeze through the population bottleneck. Uh, the the sooner we we can actually cut down on. Uh, environmental destruction, the, the better off we'll do. It's, it's increasingly becoming a moot point because, you know, we're way past individual action. And it doesn't matter if you mm. drive an SUV <laughs> at this stage. You can do fucking if anything. the traffic doesn't move, if the traffic doesn't move and nothing, it doesn't, you, you're just sitting in something more comfy. All right, may as well have something more comfy to sit in than a bone rattler. Okay, I, I can, I can kind of get that. Um, but you're, like I say, trying to, trying to sort of, trying to convince people that um deindustrialization is as an activist um angle of attack i would just say it's it's like said, it's moot but why just it's just passive now okay the, yeah. the shots I, the shots I, been with, fired I, yeah i i mean i think that it's not absolutely certain, but I think the tipping points were passed in in 2020 some major ones and particularly it's it's all about the arctic um, it's really all about the Arctic in terms of, of climate, and and we're fucked. The fuse has been lit. There's, there's fuck all we can do. You might as well fly into whatever you were going to do. Um, mm. But from from one sense, the it is still a question of leaving enough habitat for people to squeak through. But I don't think it's us. I don't think it's uh, white people in in. Uh, in urban centers, and uh, I think the Chinese and you know South Asians are fucked. They're fucked. They're way more fucked than even white people in the urban West. But, uh, but well, I, it remains to be seen, right? This is this is. Uh, it, it, it does. It remains to be seen. <laughs> but but the thing that makes me, I think that uh, Westerners have got too much of uh, you know white people. They've got too much of uh, an ego. And they, they two individualists. So I, I think that's not a good strategy uh, for, for collapse. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's. Uh, I, don't, I, I mean, the, the mindset of all these snowflakes is they're not going to survive much uh, longer in a, in a crisis. I, I see a crisis coming, an abrupt climate change, and yeah. they, they're the least well equipped. So basically, basically look at your bank balance and your income and the, and it's inverse proportion to your bank account whether you're going to survive or not. I think mm -hmm. it's a fair way to look at it. Is you know, open your fridge and if it's full of Coca-Cola, you're dead. <laughs> Especially mm -hmm. because Coca-Cola trans translates to the demographic uh, transition. Basically, if you have as much income as a Chinese or Mexican person, it correlates rather strangely with your diet. You start you you have peak uh, Coca Cola consumption right mm. right at that point, um, and uh, and your diet goes to to hell as your income uh, you go you get to the demographic transition about eleven grand a year. I, I'm really. sorry to interrupt. I'm going to have to leave you because uh, we've been a, lot, a while, and I'm actually going to work in my garden because I grow my own food and I need to do <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And I, I, so, well, maybe we should round it off. Maybe that is a good time to stop, that isn't it? Meeting. Thank you so much, Kevin. Right. Very grateful that you took the time, and I hope we'll meet you again. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. like, don't don't worry about f bombs trying to get through. I like that kind of thing. I like uh, edgy edgy debate, and uh, um, yeah. you know, people people need to hear what it is that people are saying. He, like I say, someone someone like you, who's like a South African military. To who's been through, who knows what shit looks like when things are going going tits up? That's that's in, that's valuable, right? I've got a quite a few, well, not quite a few, but a core of South Africans in coming to me, and um, we they're they're precious, right? Precious because they they cut through bullshit, right? And so so I, yeah, I've got. I've had. Uh, I'm actually American. I have American citizenship, and I've. I've had. A, I've oh, lived... I take it all back then. I take it all back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've. I've lived long. I mean, uh, I hated uh, America and the idea of America. I just got trapped. Oh, so, yeah. see you, Sophie. I will. We'll finish soon. Uh, but 
I have an insight into into the bigger picture because of um, the stuff that I've done in America. Um, I, I've actually lived longer in America than any other country, but I've um, kind of like up until my 20s in South Africa and then um, in the UK for about 10 years and the rest in the in the States, so about 50 years in the States. But, okay. um, so, but, you, but you understood the South African... Well, yeah, what, what my, uh, my insight is basically, so uh, we're on the path to South Africa. So you can, if you look at South Africa, um, objectively, <laughs> there's your future. It's front running. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I've been saying it for a long time. Um, we are, you know, you want to know where we're going? Look at South Africa. Okay. And, but, but um, in this stage, we're going over the brink. You see, the, the difference I saw was that, we had Mandela and the Clark and they saved us going over the brink. And what I've, I feel now is I, I left South Africa thinking, well, that's the end of that load of shit and I'll never, I'll see that again. I'll live in the civilized world. And what I realized was, fuck, uh, America's on, you know, the, the rest of the world's on the same trajectory and and we're not, we're going over the brink. So we, we came close to a Rwandan style genocide um, in South Africa, but the, the rest of the, the in the world in total we are going over the brink we're going to see the stuff we narrowly missed in South Africa so that's where where the lesson ends um it's yeah. it's i don't see that we can get out of this one that uplifting note we definitely want one don't want people to end on a note of hope because uh, hope is just fucking poisonous it's slave <laughs> it, it's uh water. What are for slaves? What are for slaves, man? It, we, we should put that quote, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 I'll leave with this. Um, have, have kids. There's always hope. And um, uh, pray, to the, pray to the Lord. I, like I agree that. with that. But, hey, we must have a Lord discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I, I gotta go because my systems are kicking in, yep. and I'm gonna um, right. gotta go to the bathroom. So, um, okay. all right, guys, well, take care, everybody. Take care, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Thank you very much.